Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the city of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Hammond and Councillor Wong will be absent today and I move that they be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by uh, Councillor Landers, seconded by uh, Councillor Adams, that the councillors Hammond and Huang be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, on the agenda, you will see a motion of appreciation. Lord Mayor, the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I move that this council acknowledges and commemorates the 35th anniversary of the sister city relationship between Brisbane and the city of Kobe, Japan. Sister city arrangements continue to build significant civic and cultural ties between cities and foster relationships through sporting, educational and social exchanges, as well as delivering links through tu tourism, trade and business. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the resolution as written be moved. Before I call on the Lord Mayor, can I please acknowledge in the gallery with us today, Mr Tanaka, the Consul General, Mr Tanabe, the, Co the Deputy Consul General, Mr Hayakawa, the Culture Consul, and Ms Wiley from Cultural Affairs, as well as uh, Mr Humphreys and Mrs Rackerman from the Kobe, uh, representative for Kobe and chair of the Brisbane Sister City Steering Committee and the president of the Australian Japan, Australia Japan Society of Queensland. The Lord Mayor, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, obviously, as the uh, motion uh, refers to, this is a very significant milestone in the relationship between two cities uh, that might be uh, on opposite sides of the world, uh, might be very different in many ways, but have shared a very long and productive and fruitful relationship. And a relationship that keeps getting stronger all the time. And a relationship that has uh, survived through many difficult times and only had uh, its, its, its uh, nature strengthened through those difficult times. The Brisbane Kobe Sister City Agreement was signed on the 16th of July, 1985 by former Lord Mayor Sally Ann Atkinson uh, and also uh, by the Mayor of Kobe at the time, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr T Mizaki. Kobe was Brisbane's first official sister city. Um, so uh, the beginning of uh, an era of reaching out to other cities uh, around the globe, and particularly in the Asia Pacific region, uh, the very first, the pioneering uh, sister city relationship. Kobe uh, is an incredibly important city. Uh, and it is the seventh largest city in Japan, uh, and it is the capital of the Hogo pre uh, pre Prefecture. Kobe City is located on the southern side of the main island of Honshu. Uh, I have had the pleasure of visiting uh, Kobe myself uh, in a private capacity, not in any official capacity, uh, but it is uh, an incredibly vibrant uh, and uh, culturally significant, economically successful and important city. Uh, and one that I can, uh, in my short visit there, can absolutely see why uh, it was the first of the sister city relationships and why it is a city with ongoing importance uh, to our city and um, to the business and people and culture of our city as well. Since its port uh, first opened to the world back in 1868, uh, Kobe has become an international port city. Uh, it, is, it has a high concentration of foreign affiliated companies, and is one of the, uh, which is one of the major characteristics of Kobe's economy. Major industries in Kobe include general machinery, transport machinery, iron and steel production, and also food products production. Uh, Kobe is obviously uh, famous around the world for its namesake, Kobe beef, uh, which uh, if you have ever tasted the genuine Kobe beef. Uh, it is something really quite extraordinary. Um, there, I know that there's a, a lot of different uh, wonderful cuts of beef uh, and breeds of beef which are rich in flavour, but 
uh, none so rich and tasty as uh, Kobe beef. Uh, and that was something that I did have the pleasure of tasting when I was in Kobe. Uh, you can't go to Kobe without tasting the Kobe beef. Uh, so I know why it is now uh, world renowned and I, I know it is an important part of that city's culture as well. Kobe uh, in 2008 was named as a UNESCO Creative City of Design, uh, a significant achievement. Uh, the city houses the Kobe Biomedical Innovation Cluster, a complex of uh, medical related organisations and an initiative of the city government of Kobe. Kobe, uh, it may not be as well known, is home to the world's fastest supercomputer. Uh, so uh, that is uh, something also quite extraordinary and a testament to the focus of that city in uh, high technology uh, and advancing that technology. It was actually only uh, just recently announced in the, on the 23rd of June this year as the fastest supercomputer in the world, carrying out uh, 2.8 times more calculations per second uh, than an IBM machine in the United States of America. I mentioned before, and I referred to before, that both Brisbane and Kobe have supported each other during times of crisis and natural disasters. Uh, and we know that Kobe has experienced uh, in the past uh, some incredibly destructive and significant earthquakes. Uh, and there was one uh, on the 17th of January 1995, uh, where the Brisbane Kobe Sister City Committee uh, launched an earthquake appeal within 48 hours of the earthquake occurring. Uh, that earthquake was incredibly destructive and resulted in more than 5,000 deaths and the destruction of tens of thousands of homes. Uh, in June 1995, uh, former Lord Mayor Jim Sawley visited Kobe to present the Bris Brisbane City Council's donation of uh, 82,000 Australian dollars for the earthquake appeal. Uh, and so just remember, this was a significant amount of time ago, uh, 1995. Uh, so the value of $82,000 uh, back then is obviously worth incredibly more uh, these days. In uh, 2011, uh, the former Director General from the Mayor's Office visited Brisbane on, uh, the, on behalf of the City of Kobe to present their donation to support Brisbane following the 2011 floods. And so there has been, sadly, uh, natural disasters experienced in both of these cities and in those times of need, needs, both of those cities have supported each other and reached out to each other uh, to help. And that is uh, one of the signs of a true relationship uh, when your friend is in need uh, to offer that helping hand uh, and Kobe has always been there uh, to help Brisbane uh, and we will always be there to help Kobe in their time of need. To celebrate the sister city relationship, the Kobe City Government will be launching a virtual online photo exhibition showcasing Brisbane uh, and the sister city relationship, including key city icons and landscapes to celebrate this significant uh, anniversary of 35 years. I can also announce today that we will be doing something very significant here in Brisbane to celebrate this relationship. Now, uh, I know there are a couple of bonsai fans uh, in the council chamber, and Council Murphy, I know that you are chief bonsai fan, uh, but at the Mount Kutha Botanic Gardens, uh, we have a bonsai house, which has been a popular destination for tourists and school children as well, uh, and holds a collection of bonsais of around 50 in size. And that is, uh, just in case you're not aware, a significant collection on a national scale. Uh, the, National Bonsai Collection, which is located in Canberra, uh, has around 75 trees. Uh, but I can announce today uh, that in partnership with the Kobe City Government and with an investment from Brisbane City Council that we will be upgrading and expanding our bonsai house to celebrate this relationship, but also to provide a great attraction, not only for the people of Brisbane, but for tourists arriving in our city. Uh, we will uh, invest uh, 2.6 million over the coming years to upgrade the bonsai house and to uh, strive to have the largest collection of bonsais in Australia. Uh, and so we hope to surpass that national collection of 75 trees uh, to generate a collection of up to 100 trees uh, here at Mount Kutha. And so uh, it's, an important, uh, it's an important investment in the relationship, but it's also an important investment in a facility that is 
uh, now 20 years old, um, and I do know that if you've been there recently, uh, it is certainly a facility that is in need of an upgrade and an improvement. And so we are going to, uh, through this uh, investment and in celebrating this in incredibly important milestone with our longest sister city, uh, make this investment over the coming years uh, for the people of Brisbane uh, and to tourists and also to celebrate that incredibly important relationship. Uh, I do want to uh, express my uh, gratitude and thanks uh, to the Mayor of Kobe, uh, Mr Hisamoto, uh, to the Kobe City Government, uh, to the uh, Consulate General representatives that we have here today in the chamber that, was, uh, that were referred to by the Chair, including Mr Tanaka uh, and his colleagues, to the members of the uh, Sister City Steering Committee, uh, including Mr Ross Humphreys, and to Mrs Margaret Rackerman, uh, President of the Australia-Japan Society, Queensland. Uh, and also to all of the community members and businesses that support this incredibly important relationship. Uh, I want to thank you for your ongoing efforts uh, to support this relationship and the growth and, and uh, positive development of our two uh, sister cities. Uh, and may this 35-year milestone just be uh, the beginning of an even much longer and productive relationship. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I want to take this opportunity to support uh, this motion of appreciation before us today and thank our amazing sister city, Kobe, and commemorate our ongoing relations. Brisbane's relationship with Kobe is strong and prosperous and has only been strengthening over the last three decades, building many cultural and business ties. Uh, as mentioned by the Lord Mayor, both Brisbane and Kobe have faced very troubling times over uh, recent decades. In 1995, of course, Kobe fell victim to a devastating earthquake, and in 2011, our city was ravaged by record floods. In both these times of despair, each city stood up to help each other. We raised tens of thousands of dollars for Kobe to help them recover, and they returned the favour to us in 2011. Intercity relations like this one are paramount, and let's help, hope our bond with Kobe continues to thrive. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise in support of this very important motion of appreciation, and can I also acknowledge the representatives of the Consulate General who are here today, and it is wonderful to have your presence in this chamber. It has been five years since I travelled to Kobe to celebrate the 30th um, year of the Sister City Arrangement, and that was after we had a delegation here from Kobe. So we very much have a reciprocal appreciation for the trade and economic ties that we have, but also the friendships that have developed over many years of having this Sister City Arrangement. It is also important to acknowledge Mr Humphreys and Mrs Rackerman who are in the gallery today as they also travelled as part of that delegation to Kobe five years ago. It was interesting that the Lord Mayor also mentioned the supercomputer and the biomedical faculties that are based in Kobe. These were some of the locations that we visited whilst in Kobe at that time and can I say that the efforts that go into the progress from a biomed perspective by the people in Kobe is second to none. They are really, really endeavouring to bring the best of their talent to the rest of the world, and it should be acknowledged. We do have a very, very strong bond between Brisbane and Kobe, and over the years, we have had many opportunities where we have had delegations that have come here and that is greatly appreciated, the continuing association. And can I say that there is a very special place in my heart with the Kobe Swimming Association, um, because every time they've come here, I've managed to catch up with them. And the way you foster those young talent, uh, the young talent there, it is, it is wonderful. And the connectivity that we have with Australian swimming through that mechanism here in Brisbane is great. I think... We underestimate the power of the Sister City Agreements. They lay the foundation for so many avenues of trade, of business relationships, 
but most importantly of creating those networks and making sure that they are not only enhanced but they thrive over time. So it is with great pleasure today that I say a very, very special thank you to all the people in Kobe who have been part of this sister city agreement over many years for the efforts that you have put in because it certainly makes our Brisbane-Kobe relationship all the better. Thank you. Further speakers? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I also rise to support the motion of appreciation today on our sister city relationship between Brisbane and Kobe. Um, if we know that the relationship, as everyone has said, has been getting stronger and stronger over the years, business, cultural and social. Uh, we've seen more and more businesses connecting with Kobe and leveraging that sister city relationship as well. And there's been a lot of synergies, particularly over the last couple of years. Kobe was selected as a pre-training camp for the Australian Paralympic team in the lead up to, unfortunately, what didn't happen, the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And I personally had some fantastic experiences with exchanges events that happened in my local schools that are specialists in Japanese, Wellers Hills Primary School. Uh, Kobe students visited for an exchange and we heard from Australian Paralympians and guest speakers from Paralympics Australia and how excited they were to be heading to Kobe for pre-training as well. UQ Business School was contracted to support Kobe for the Rugby World Cup last year. UQ's Institute of Con Continuing and TESOL Education always has an open space for a Kobe student year on year. And the business mission we saw in 2016, which included Kobe in Tokyo, saw $400 million worth of outcomes for biz Brisbane businesses. Kobe has always been a strong supporter of the Asia-Pacific City Summit, with Vice Mayor Terasaki joining us last year uh, and speaking on the sub-theme of innovations in cities during the summit and by the, uh, the sounds of the opportunities they have in Kobe, they know all about innovation as well. We look forward to continuing this relationship from the Bonsai House to the Olympics when they're finally happening for decades to come. Can I say thank you on behalf of our special guests that are here, thank you, and particularly particularly from the international relations team uh, in City Hall that love doing work with you and we look forward to strengthening our sister city ties for years to come. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. The Lord Mayor. I will now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. Uh, I will now um, seek confirmation of the minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,631st meeting held on Tuesday 27 October 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. May I please have a seconder? Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Lander, seconded by Councillor Adams, that the minutes of the 4,631st meeting of Council held on the 27th of October 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I'd like to draw your attention to the Item four, the public participation. Today we have joining us Mrs Cynthia Murray, who will address the uh, chamber on a request for Brisbane City Council to purchase two lots adjoining Francis Lookout, Corinda. Welcome, Mrs Murray. Uh, Mr Piers will assist you. Um, you will have five minutes to speak to the council, uh, beginning when you begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr Chairman, Lord Mayor and Councillors. My name is Cynthia Murray and I represent the residents of the Corinda Sherwood community and 350 signatories to ask you to support our petition for the Bushland Acquisition Fund purchase of two 405 square metre lots adjoining the State and Brisbane City Council heritage listed for Francis Lookout. I advise that I will not personally benefit from this acquisition. Francis Lookout was originally established in 1863 by the Francis family after the death of their infant son. In 1936, the Francis family trustees gifted the site to the Brisbane City Council. The development site adjoining the lookout consists of four 405 square metre lots. They are zoned Res A, but for over 100 years, two houses only existed over the four lots, providing a land buffer between the houses and the lookout. The developer proposes to build an oversized small lot house on each of the four lots. The first has been DA approved. The vegetation along the boundary with the park and the heritage registered forest red gum, estimated to be over 200 years old, are at severe risk as excavation will occur a metre from the boundary and within the root system of the forest red gum. Undermining the root system will weaken the root structure of the tree. The diameter at breast height, or DBH, of the forest red gum was stated as 1.2 metres in the arborist report commissioned for the developer. 
An independent arborist report, which you have, clearly shows the DBH to actually be 1.5 metres. This is damning evidence that the tree, the TPZ, is grossly inadequate and places at extreme risk of destabilisation the magnificent forest red gum, which, as per the original arborist report, already has only a fair to poor tolerance to construction. Establishing, establishing the correct DBH is essential to correctly determine the tree protection zone, 14.4 metres as per the DA, but it should be at least 18 metres. Francis Lookout is thus under immediate threat from development. Councillor Adams stated on ABC Radio that the only thing stopping the approval of the DA for the first lot were the grave concerns she and her town planners had about the original SARA response. As the SARA response was based on the developer's arborist report, her concern was justified and an urgent review of that DA is essential. Lord Mayor, it is clear the only way to protect Francis Lookout and its wildlife corridor is for the Bushland Acquisition Fund to acquire this land. In 2008, $6.2 million of the fund was used to purchase three lots accessible via easement in the Holland Park Ward, benefiting only the residents whose properties adjoin these lots. Lord Mayor and Councillors, you were advised that these lots were a koala habitat, but Deborah Tabart, founder of the Australian Koala Foundation, described the purchase as a waste of money. In contrast, Lord Mayor, the purchase of the two lots in Corinda will have true ecological and environmental benefit by protecting a genuine link within an ecological corridor. Francis Lookout is located 500 metres from the Sherwood Arboretum and a mere 60 metres from the Brisbane River Wildlife Corridor, which runs from the Sherwood Arboretum along the river under the Corinda Bluff to the Fort Road Bushland Reserve and Rocks River Park. Local residents have observed in their yards and in Francis Lookout echidnas, snakes, scrub turkeys, possums, lizards and birds, including kookaburras, cockatoos, galahs, lorikeets, parrots, kites, whipbirds, curlews and recently a wedgetail eagle. Wallabies have been observed in the early mornings at St Aidan's School, 200 metres east of Francis Lookout. Happily, after the cessation of civil works on the Francis Street lots this year, the resident pair of bush stone curlews has returned to their habitat in Francis Lookout. I've given you photos. The female made her nest on the vacant land adjoining the lookout. Fortunately, construction has not yet commenced and they now have two healthy looking chicks. Purchasing the two lots adjoining Francis Lookout will protect our beautiful forest red gum, preserve the amenity and historical value of Francis Lookout for all in the community, and protect the habitat of the many native animals who pass through or live in Francis Lookout, thus enhancing and preserving this genuine wildlife corridor. Lord Mayor, 66% of us in the Tennyson Ward voted for you in March. I ask you to honour the faith we had in you then, and when it is presented to you, please support our petition to protect purchase the lots adjoining Francis Lookout as they are ecologically essential. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mrs Murray. Um, councillors, you would have heard Mrs Murray refer to some paperwork that is available for you here next to the sign-in booklet, uh, the sign-in book, please, um, uh, due to the COVID restrictions, it is there, uh, publicly available. If you wish to have one, please grab it when you sign in. It is there and it will be tabled as part of the minutes as well. Uh, in response, Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, thank you, Mrs Murray, for presenting to Council today. It's clear from your presentation in the Chamber that you feel very strongly about this matter, and uh, in particular, um, I can assure you that Council is committed to uh, maintaining and supporting heritage places and other places of significance. And I do note that Francis Lookout is on the Queensland Heritage Register and that any development on that site, as I think you've noted, would need to be uh, approved and supported by the Queensland Government State Assessment and Referral Agency as the responsible authority for overviewing any development on that particular site. So, as you've indicated, the, the sites in question are proposed to be used for residential purposes and I note that historically they've been residential uses. So as the uh, Francis Lookout Park in its current form is considered to be appropriate for the recreational needs of the community, and particularly uh, in the context of more significant priorities across the city, at this point in time, Council doesn't have any plans to expand the park there, and there is no other purpose that Council would acquire that land for. So it is also worth noting that within very close proximity to Francis Lookout is the Sherwood Arboretum, which is a very significant 
local park and green space. So when considering the options and priorities for additional parkland and green space across the city, other suburbs would be considered to have a higher priority and certainly we hear in this chamber regularly that uh, there are needs across those suburbs which have higher density. So in the context of the times that we're in, we're obviously having to be very careful with the way we allocate funds within council. Um, we have budget pressures and accordingly we're looking to allocate funds to those uh, sectors that have greatest need and where the community gets the best value. So accordingly, uh, giving, giving consideration to all of these factors, the view at this point is that uh, council will not be acquiring those blocks. I do, however, thank you for coming into the chamber this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mrs Murray, for your time. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you. Um, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I move suspension of standing orders to enable me to move uh, the following urgency motion that Brisbane City Council congratulates the Palaszczuk Government on their re-election. Seconded. I've, I've just sent that thank to... Thank you. That will be um, distributed thanks to much, all Chair. councillors in a moment. Uh, you have, excuse me, it's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cook. Um, Councillor Cassidy, you have three minutes. Please limit your comments to urgency. Thank you very much, Chair. Right now. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, just days ago, just days ago, the people of Brisbane put their trust in the state Labor government. Now we know that this isn't the outcome that the Lord Mayor wanted or hoped for, given each and every week he came in here uh, to criticise and pick fights and blame the state government for every uh, action he has ever taken and stuffed up. But that made no difference, of course, to how the people of Brisbane particularly voted in this election. So the relationship between uh, this Lord Mayor and the LNP administration here in this place and the state government has been badly damaged, I feel. So I think it's both urgent and important that we hit the reset button and we can do that today by congratulating, as a council, the Palaszczuk government on their re-election. The Lord Mayor has to make peace, Chair, with the state Labor team for the benefit of Brisbane. There is a real urgency that we get off on the right foot here because the mammoth task of rebuilding Brisbane's economy post-COVID needs to be front and centre. The state government has announced, of course, Chair, $200 million in funding through the South East Queensland Community Stimulus Package, a package announced by the Premier to help our suburbs uh, rebuild from this pandemic. So we need Councillor to be... Councillor Cassidy, can I just draw you back to urgency, please? I think it's urgent, Chair, that we are uh, front and centre as part of this conversation about how that funding will be allocated. And I think the best way that Brisbane can put itself forward is by this council congratulating the Palaszczuk government on their uh, election. We need a coordinated effort to make sure that funding flows to our suburbs. Now, to make sure that happens, Chair, we think the Lord Mayor should take this opportunity to hit the reset button. Instead of picking fights continually with the state government, we can today hit the refresh, hit the reset button, and a great way to do that would be for all councillors today to join in this motion in congratulating Anastasia Palaszczuk and her team on their re-election. Uh, I have a resolution, uh, an urgency resolution has been uh, uh, provided to all councillors. On the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. I believe that's the two thirds required. That's, uh, that has been uh, carried. Um, Councillor Cassidy. To your motion, please. Well, thanks very much, Chair. Look, we don't we don't need to spend that resetting. Thanks very much, Chair. We don't need to spend too long. I'm sure the Lord Mayor will get up and uh, and congratulate uh, the state government. Be very interested to hear what he has to say. Uh, but I think uh, the Premier's leadership uh, throughout the health pandemic and the plan that she and her team put forward uh, in terms of uh, the economic recovery, uh, the jobs that our communities will need, and particularly here in Brisbane, as we have a special interest being the Brisbane City Council, uh, I think uh, the plan that was put forward was very strongly endorsed by the people of Brisbane. So this is a great opportunity for this administration and this chamber to put the uh, best foot forward uh, in working with the state government uh, uh, to deliver the results that um, people of Brisbane need. Um, that uh, $200 million funding through the South East Queensland Community Stimulus Package, uh, uh, Brisbane is eligible for that funding, unlike previous rounds of funding. So I think it is important uh, that the Brisbane City Council, and uh, through this motion, I'm sure uh, this administration, by allowing uh, this to get up for debate, uh, well, hopefully, uh, will join us in that congratulations and um, certainly reset that relationship. So I'll um, be very keen to hear what the Lord Mayor has had to say. 
I am blocked from his social media chair, so I'm not sure whether he has, he has publicly said anything to congratulate uh, the Premier or not, um, but I'll be very interested to hear what he has to say now. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I rise to support this motion, uh, but what I can tell the Chamber is we didn't need the Labor Party to pull this political stunt um, uh, to have the same intent, because, in fact, I have been in direct contact with the Premier already uh, to congratulate her on uh, the win, just as the Premier did when I won earlier this year. She personally contacted me, and that was the respectable thing to do, uh, and I did the same uh, when she won the election on the weekend. Obviously, uh, myself and my team are devastated by the result. Uh, we have zero respect for the Labor Party or its ability to govern and manage uh, the economy and the recovery, uh, but we do respect democracy. We do respect democracy, and the people of Queensland delivered an outcome, and we respect that outcome. Uh, we also uh, thank uh, the Premier uh, for I guess the way in which she has uh, reached out to us in a number of ways, including her personal support uh, for Brisbane Metro at a critical time when we needed it, right in the lead up to the uh, caretaker period. And we respect and appreciate that as well. So uh, ultimately, Councillor Cassidy mentions that uh, the relationship is important. I absolutely agree. It takes two to tango. Uh, and we are always willing to work with any government that is willing to work with us uh, and I put that offer on the table, just as we worked with this state government in the lead up to caretaker period to finalise those metro approvals. Uh, we will continue to go forward in that, uh, in that respect, uh, and we look forward to a positive and productive working relationship with the state government. Now, obviously, I, I did also want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to uh, Deb Frecklington and the LMP team. Uh, once again, in this democratic society that we live in, uh, it is the competition uh, that keeps our democracy uh, strong and healthy. Uh, and I think Deb and her team, but specifically Deb herself uh, and Tim Mander, the de deputy leader, they, uh, they deserve particular mention, uh, did an incredible job and worked so hard. I have never seen uh, that level of work ethic um, right across this big state uh, that they uh, sought to represent. Um, and I think that both sides uh, deserve uh, some acknowledgement and credit, but I certainly do uh, join with other councillors in congratulating the government on their election win. Further speakers? Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr Chairman, bingo. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chair, and it is um, certainly refreshing to hear the Lord Mayor um, finally once um, say congratulations uh, publicly, and I acknowledge that he contacted um, the Premier and he said that, and uh, the Premier had previously contacted him, and I did that um, to the Lord Mayor as well when he uh, was elected uh, earlier this year as well. Uh, and it is very important, and I certainly hope that for uh, the benefit of the residents of Brisbane, we do see uh, Council uh, at a at a political level, work constructively with the state government. I acknowledge what the Lord Mayor says, that it takes two to tango. We've seen the state government put forward a whole raft of plans, and we'll see a budget come down on the 1st of December uh, to address those economic issues as we emerge from the uh, COVID uh, health pandemic uh, and we see uh, the results of the COVID recession. Uh, so we need to, for the benefit of all the residents of Brisbane, work together to make sure uh, that people are supported, uh, that jobs are supported here in Brisbane as they uh, will be right across this state. Uh, on a personal level, I also want to uh, congratulate the three state members that I uh, share my uh, ward boundaries with, the State Member for Sandgate, Sterling Hinchliff, uh, the State Member for Nudgee, Leanne Linnard, and of course the return State Member for Aspley, uh, Bart Mellish. Uh, the people of Aspley certainly, <laughs> certainly made the right decision uh, in retaining, uh, retaining Bart as their, um, as their State Member. Uh, 
um, the commitments uh, that he uh, made at the 2017 election, uh, he is seeing out now. Uh, we see the new uh, Northside Indoor Sports Stadium, the home of the Northside Wizards, which uh, created hundreds of jobs and is providing a, uh, the first home that Northside Wizards have had in decades. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, funding committed and being delivered for the Beams Road Open Level Crossing project, something which this Lord Mayor supported uh, the State Labor Government on. Didn't make much fanfare of that, I'm sure, because Amanda Cooper wouldn't have liked that. Uh, but we are seeing, we are seeing uh, some amazing investments uh, on the north side in terms of infrastructure, whether that's at local schools, uh, on roads, uh, in our community sporting organisations from this state Labor government, and the strong results we've seen in Sandgate, Nudgee, Ashley, and in all Labor-held seats around Brisbane is testament to the commitment that Labor state members have uh, to their communities. And I think um, Stephen Wardill hit the nail on the head when it comes to the type of campaign that the LNP runs at a state level. Uh, they are a lazy bunch of people. Uh, and I think the people uh, really endorse the kind of work ethic that state Labor MPs and members of the Palaszczuk government bring to the table. I now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes Division. have it. Division. Division called by Councillor uh, Cassidy and Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. <laughs> councillors, uh, all councillors are present. We will therefore uh, vote. On that division, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 25 in favour. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention item five on the agenda, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any standing committees? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Standards, Community Health and Safety Committee, Councillor Marks. Councillor Marks, last week a pile of horse manure was dumped on a busy city road in the middle of peak hour traffic. What were the implications on Council of this and other acts of civil disobedience by Extinction Rebellion? Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank um, Councillor Toomey for the question. I have to admit to my ignorance to not knowing what Extinction Rebellion stood for, so I googled it. They are a global environmental movement with a stated aim of using non-violent civil disobedience to compel government action to avoid tipping points in the climate system, biodiversity loss and the risk of social and ecological collapse. I thought that sounds okay, until the two days before the state election where we witnessed um, an act of civil disobedience by Extinction Rebellion. They thought they'd get the chance to, where they, with the state election that we just mentioned, they could have had the chance to exercise their democratic voice. Um, activists from that group organised the dumping of a truckload of horse manure on Alice Street in the CBD, blocking access to the Riverside Expressway. Mr Chair, what really upsets me about this act was even more than the peak hour traffic chaos it caused for our residents trying to get to work and go about their business. There's a complete and utter waste of council resources in having to clean it up. It took four of our urban amenity officers and three flying gangs, th trucks, an entire hour to clean up this large amount of mess. They had to clean it up by hand with a shovel in that hot morning sun. We actually even saw footage of a police officer picking up a shovel and lending our hands a crew, our crews a hand. Mr Chair, I would hope that the members of the Chamber will join me in expressing our thanks to that police officer and the other members of QPS who managed traffic to keep the sites safe while our crews undertook their work. As a Chair responsible for amenity standards across our city and suburbs, I'm profoundly disappointed by the waste of these terrific officers' time and the misallocation of Council's resources. This was a time our flying gangs could have been out in the suburbs, responding to resident or councillor requests for improvements to fix our roads, our footpaths, our parks or our waterways. When I became chair of this portfolio, I sent an email to every councillor here offering to come out for a visit to the wards and see the issues, and in particular the maintenance jobs concerning you and your residents most. 
I've been out now with most of the LNP councillors, a few of the Labor opposition, and councillor for uh, Tennyson and also councillor for the Gabba Ward. And each visit was a great experience. I got the same piece of feedback every single time. The importance of our manatee crews in responding to jobs in a timely fashion and performing their work to a good standard. In recent months, though, we've witnessed de demonstrations at King George Square vandalising the space with graffiti, political slogans and symbols. And the last instance where we had officers on standby at double overtime, waiting in the streets for the protesters to finish, to clean up the mess that they left behind, would actually created a fire in King George Square. Vandalism that inevitably requires crew to be tasked on weekend shifts to perform the laborious job of water blasting the space clean. We've seen council fountains van, uh, vandalised with ink, requiring specialist and expensive draining and cleaning work to occur, all billed back to the ratepayer. So moving back to the events of last Thursday to add insult to injury, in addition to offering no help in cleaning up the waste they dumped on our roads for the purpose of a political stunt, protesters even tried to disrupt our clean-up efforts. Our officers have reported protesters attempting to block the path of a council vehicle involved in the clean-up and even at one point jumped on the front of a truck to stop it. Can you imagine the life of that council officer ongoing if he had inadvertently run over a protester and harmed that person in any way, shape or form? purely by going about their business. This is a shameful and dangerous behaviour that demonstrates such disrespect for the hard-working men and women in our urban amenities branch. The worst part about it all is that well, then they talk about the environment, none of that horse manure could actually be recycled and used in any way because it had been on the road, it was considered contaminated. So it all had to be um, trucked out to um, the Rochdale landfill, so that's where it ended up, which it could have been used on someone's garden, much better process. But I want to thank the officers on the ground that morning for going about their work and remaining calm and courteous. Mr Chair, people have a right to express their political opinion, and I, ex I respect that right, but I am tired of it occurring at the expense of ratepayers and the reallocation of valuable council resources. Thank you. <coughs> Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, last week you decommissioned the Norman Park and Thornton Street ferry terminals without warning, when previously you told residents all services would be back as soon as possible. You also told Brisbane the wooden monohull ferries would return to the river. That too now seems like a lie. You've been stalling for months now, blaming repair delays on border closures and that you were waiting on experts from other states. You've been asked if you had applied for a border exemption to get the ferry restoration process underway, and no clear answer was given. Lord Mayor, you've had ample time to get the repairs underway, and you've continuously made excuses and muddied the water. So here's your chance to be honest with Brisbane residents and come clean. What are your true intentions with the wooden monohull ferries? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I have, from day one, been absolutely honest with the people of Brisbane, uh, and it has only been the Labor Party that has been spreading lies and misinformation on this matter. If I hark back to the events that Councillor Cook has referred to, uh, remember when we acted decisively in the interests of public safety, Councillor Cook and her colleagues said that we had overreacted overreacted and that it was unnecessary that we had taken the vessels off the water. Uh, so this was their first response. Uh, and there's been many changing positions since then, uh, but we have been consistent. And at every point of the way, uh, we have uh, endeavoured to make sure we keep the people of Brisbane, and in particular the ferry users, up to date uh, with what is happening. Now. What has happened with the wooden ferries is a uh, situation that has angered me incredibly. I am extremely angry and disappointed uh, that, at that situation as the way it has evolved. But I haven't uh, let that anger get the better of me. Uh, we have, as a team, turned it into action. Now, we don't know how long it will take uh, to get those ferries repaired, and at this time, uh, no one has been able to come to me with the estimated cost to repair those ferries. I have not yet received that information. 
And what I can say, though, is that rather than sitting on our hands uh, and making excuses, we took decisive action. Uh, we got one of the uh, mono held ferries back on the water as quickly as possible. That was the steel hull vessel. And that is now servicing Councillor Cook's residence uh, and also Councillor Howard's residence on that cross river route between uh, Tenerife uh, and uh, Balimba. What we've also done is we've managed to pull out all stops to source five new CityCat vessels. Uh, and those vessels are now uh, ready to soon enter service. Tomorrow, we will see the beginning of a new contract for our ferry operations. And that contract and the operations will transfer uh, from the current operator uh, to the winner of the tender, which was a highly competitive process, uh, who are Sealink, uh, to operate our ferries going forward from tomorrow. And as part of that, uh, they uh, have done work uh, which has been supported actively by Council uh, to bring those uh, kitty cat ferries up to a standard which would be appropriate uh, for public transport use on the Brisbane River. Uh, there's been a lot of upgrade and improvement work done. Uh, there's been a lot of work done over a short period of time to get them ready for service. Uh, and soon uh, that, those vessels will enter the service. In fact, on the 15th of November, I can confirm, those five uh, kitty cats will enter service to uh, help bolster our river services on uh, the Brisbane River. Now, it goes without saying that when you had nine vessels um, and now you only have six vessels, you can't provide the exact same service that you were previously providing. Uh, so we are doing our best to provide the maximum level of service possible with the vessels that we have. But the drop from those smaller ferries from nine down to six means that there are impacts. And I apologise for those impacts. Uh, but if we hadn't been such a proactive administration, we'd only have one vessel out of those nine but we now have six because we acted quickly to source other vessels. And I can assure you, if there were other alternatives available, uh, we would have sourced them as well. But we've uh, got a great outcome, I think, in the interim period to provide those kitty cat services. Uh, and we will continue working uh, to restore services as quickly as we can. But there are a number of other issues here um, that also uh, we have been quite clear on. Uh, and are really important factors when it comes to river transport. There has never been an administration in the history of Brisbane that has invested more in our river transport, in our city cats, in our terminals, uh, in the, the whole range of support that comes with providing high quality river uh, transport on the Brisbane River. And whether it's replacing city cats, uh, investing in new city cats, the double decker city cats, uh, or upgrading terminals, uh, we have a record that is second to no administration in the history of our city. Let me point out the history here. Uh, now, Labor likes to claim credit for the introduction of the city cats. And yes, that is exactly what they did. Uh, it was a good decision and one that I support. Lord Mayor, your uh, time has expired. Uh, further questions? Councillor Owen. Thank you. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Last week, Brisbane City Council was honoured to win the Climate Council's Metropolitan Innovation Award for Brisbane Metro's electric charging. Can you please outline the award details and what this means for the award-winning Brisbane Metro project? Councillor Murphy. Well, thank you, Chair, and I uh, thank Councillor Owen for the question. I know, Councillor Owen, that you've been a big advocate for the award-winning Brisbane Metro project, and particularly the opportunities across the network to improve services for the suburbs and to provide connections to our turn-up-and-go public transport game-changer. Mr Chair, the Lord Mayor and I have been talking... <coughs> Councillors, uh, please. The Lord Councillor Mayor and Murphy. I have been talking for a long time about the benefits of Brisbane Metro, including the major improvement to public transport services for our city and the environmental benefits of our state-of-the-art all-electric metro vehicle, which is why it was an extraordinary honour to have the Metro project recognised at a national level at the City's Power Partnership Climate Awards. Brisbane City Council has been a member of the City's Power Partnership since late 2017, an initiative of uh, Councillor McLaughlin's. It is comprised of 139 Australian no, no, local no, governments. No, no interjections, please. No, Councillor Johnston, please. Representing 11 cease million interject. Australians. No, Councillor Murphy, please stop. Councillor Johnston, please, uh, please cease interjecting. 
and allow the answer to be heard. No, Councillor Johnston, when I ask you to be silent, please, please do so. Councillor Murphy. You know you're on a winner chair when they start interjecting like that. And these local governments have signed up to commit to embed and to advocate for sustainable economic solutions to climate change. And on Thursday evening last week, I had the privilege of attending via Zoom the City's Power Partnership Awards ceremony hosted by Craig Rewcastle, the star of ABC's War on Waste. And I was honoured to accept on behalf of Brisbane City Council the Metropolitan Innovation Award for the fully electric metro vehicle and our innovative flash charging strategy. Now, the City's Power Partnership is an initiative of the Climate Council, and we are truly humbled to receive this prestigious award by an organisation that champions leadership in climate action. The Metro vehicle is, as I said, a state-of-the-art electric vehicle that can charge in four to six minutes, and with 60 fully electric vehicles, we can get up to 150 passengers travelling up to 90 kilometres an hour uh, on the busway to their destination at any of the 18 stations along 21 kilometres of Metro line. By choosing to use an electric vehicle for Metro, we can take 50,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere over a 20-year lifespan, which is a equivalent to taking 800 cars off the road for 20 years. As councillors will know, new high capacity and high frequency metro services will run along the existing busways and link with suburban bus services as part of a better plan network. And in a time when the state government can't make one government department carbon neutral, we not only have our whole of council operations carbon neutral, but we are also making the move towards our transport system being more sustainable, cleaner and greener. In fact, Brisbane City Council is the only carbon neutral certified organisation in the country with an operating landfill and a large public transport fleet. But Bre Brisbane Metro's environmental credentials don't end their chair. Craig Rewcastle was very excited to learn that unlike a lot of other major infrastructure projects, Metro doesn't involve enormous greenfield sites with tens of thousands of tonnes of new concrete and steel. In fact, for most of Metro's alignment, we are recycling the existing busway and stations. And it's not often that major infrastructure projects seek to upgrade and enhance rather, please. rather than build everything new from scratch. So I would say in this way, Brisbane Metro is the country's biggest recycling project. And by doing this, we are being environmentally conscious and we are driving the ratepayers' dollar even further, Chair. It's our very own war on waste. All right, councillors, that's enough. Now, clearly, Chair, other councillors in this place are starting to listen and convert to Brisbane Metro thought. Yesterday, Councillor Cassidy was busy uh, doing some recycling of his own on 612 ABC, trying to resurrect a story from 2012 about Jim Sawley's exploding gas buses. But when he was asked if he supported Council's Brisbane Metro, he said, absolutely, I think we need to be going faster than just Brisbane Metro. So um, I don't know what behind, what's behind this change of tack from Councillor Cassidy. Maybe it's since he lost the beard. He's found in his heart the ability to support the award-winning Brisbane Metro. New beard, new me. Uh, because when you look at Councillor Cassidy's record on Brisbane Metro, Chair, it's all over the place. Now, in May 2018, he didn't support a contract for Brisbane Metro. In June, he didn't support the significant contracting plan for early works. In October 2018, he supported the first tranche of depot property resumptions. And in March 2019, he supported the significant contracting plan for the depot. Uh, but then again, in November, he didn't support the second tranche of depot property resumptions, nor did he support the contract award for the battery electric vehicles. In May of this year, he didn't support the Metro contract management and project verification contract, but in November, he supported the electric Metro vehicle on radio with Steve Austin. So late and situational though it may be, Chair, we welcome Councillor Cassidy's support. On this side of the Chamber, Chair, we are delivering Councilor innovative Murphy. solutions Councilor such Murphy, as Brisbane your time Metro. Has are there further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, we have growing concerns about the safety and operation of Brisbane's new double-decker City Cats. There have been multiple reports now that there are serious design flaws and corners have been cut when making these boats. In one report it says, and I quote, copies of the tender documents show that some of the mandatory criteria were not met. One key example is that the new design must be under a certain weight so it can be lifted out of the water with the council-owned travel lift. It ended up too heavy and too wide, but they accepted it anyway and then ordered more. Now we're hearing that these new boats are crashing into terminals. Chair, I thought this Lord Mayor 
could get at least one project right without any hiccups, but apparently not. Lord Mayor, why does every project you touch result in cost blowouts, delays and safety issues for Brisbane residents? The Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, thank you for the opportunity to respond to this uh, question. Uh, I can tell you that um, I am very proud of the fact that I touch a whole heap of projects because those opposite have never touched a single project. Uh, and if I have anything to do with it, they will never get the opportunity to touch a single project. Uh, Councillor Cook says she's touched a, cook, a chook raffle uh, last week, I think, but that's the most management experience they have ever had. Uh, I am proud that I am a builder. I am proud that I have a team of builders that build new infrastructure, that build the Brisbane Metro, that build new city cats, that build new terminals, that build road upgrades, that build Victoria Park and a whole network of green space and parks across the city. I will continue no, to count, build no, infrastructure Johnson, and assets for the people of Brisbane. Lord Mayor, um, councillors, as I, as I often say, I always tolerate a level of uh, interjections, but please keep them brief and please don't go overboard. The Lord Mayor, please continue. And I am proud of the projects that we have delivered. And I've got to say, the people of Brisbane are loving Kingsman Smith Drive. Um, it is the latest of many projects that we have successfully delivered, uh, which have delivered a fantastic outcome for the people of Brisbane and will continue to do so. And congratulations, uh, Councillor David McLaughlin, uh, for bringing that project to a very successful conclusion. Uh, we are all proud of that project and the many other infrastructure projects that have e either been delivered or are in process of being delivered or are in the planning to be delivered. Uh, so whether it's green bridges or anything uh, down to the local park upgrade, we will continue to be builders. Now, does that mean every project goes exactly to plan? Of course not. Anyone with any experience in project management knows that uh, the true measure of a good project manager is not whether a project goes perfectly, but how you deal with the challenges that come up. And we will always take those challenges head on. But let's talk specifically about double-decker city cats. Now, I can say uh, I have uh, been really excited about these new additions to our fleet and uh, took many, many opportunities to visit while the city cats were under construction. Now, we now have two that are delivered and we have another one under construction right now. Uh, and these are the most fantastic vessels that we have ever seen uh, providing public transport on the river. They are absolutely fantastic. They are world class. Uh, they provide an incredible service. Uh, and more importantly, I am so proud that they were designed and built here in Brisbane by a Brisbane company, by Brisbane people, with e exceptional craftsmanship, uh, with exceptional innovation in design. Uh, but what Councillor Cassidy is referring to, I think, um, is uh, a column that appeared in the back section of the Courier Mail, otherwise known as the gossip section. <laughs> The best in news and gossip, except there's no news, it's just gossip. Uh, and what we see here is unsourced claims, unsourced claims from what appears to be, uh, you know, someone who has something against this vessel. Maybe, maybe uh, it might have been someone involved in the tender process that wasn't successful. I don't know. Uh, but uh, what I do know, what I do know is these are the best city cats we've ever had. Uh, and they are fantastic. And I've also seen them on the lift, being lifted out of the river, being lifted into the river. So any claim that they can't be lifted, absolute rubbish. What we have is unsourced fake news here, and we know that Labor loves fake news. They set up their own fake news website, and guess what? They don't go to the news section of the paper, they go straight to the gossip column. That's where they get their news from, uh, but it's not news, it's just rubbish. And in fact, I am offended on behalf of the great uh, men and women who have built those city cats and who strive right now in that factory in Murray to build more for us. And you know what? I want more. I want seven more of these vessels to be built by local people uh, because they, as I said, are the best form of public transport we have ever seen on the Brisbane River and they are certainly the best generation of city cats that we have ever seen. And so I am proud of that project. Uh, it is a fantastic project. Uh, and I am proud of the jobs and innovation uh, that we are supporting through our procurement in Brisbane City Council. Now, that procurement process uh, was highly competitive, and I understand that 
there are some people that might have missed out that might be a bit upset about that. I, I can accept that, that happens. This is competition. Just like I'm upset we didn't win the election on the weekend. But that is the nature of competition. And guess what? Competition makes us all stronger and better. Uh, and I know that this particular tender process uh, exceeded our expectations massively. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in one... Um Lord Mayor, your Sorry. time has expired. Yep. Further questions? Councillor... No, Councillor Landers. My question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the Schrinner administration is continuing to support the Brisbane community with the approval of further funding for clubs in our council leased facilities. Can you outline how this funding will support clubs during this vulnerable time? Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, uh, thank you, Councillor Landers, for the question. We all know that Australia is locked in a battle to survive the most challenging economic environment in a generation. And we know that our community groups have been hit incredibly hard by the pandemic and that these tough times will be felt for some time. The Schrinner administration is doing everything possible to help them get through this difficult time. We have waived the rent for all council lessees and tenants until the end of 2020, but we know that water and energy bills keep coming. So today, I am pleased to announce a new multi-million res resilient clubs program to help cut the operating costs for our much-loved community organisations. This 3.3 million two-year program will be delivered by City Smart Council's Sustainability Agency and follows feedback gathered from residents as part of the Economic Recovery Task Force survey, which found our community clubs and organisations were facing uncertain times due to the pandemic. Council's Resilient Clubs, Clubs program will deliver maintenance works and upgrades at up to 180 sites. It will help more than 30 clubs install solar systems and energy efficiency measures to help cut their energy bills. And it will provide additional support to community organisations with a water and energy coaching program. It has certainly been great to see a lot of our clubs starting to reignite and thrive post-coronavirus, and these new measures will not only help clubs now, but well into the future. This multi-million dollar initiative doesn't deliver a short-term solution. We are investing in the tools to help our community groups reduce operating costs for many years to come. Saving money on water and electricity will free up funds for our community organisations to spend on the important work that they do every day in our communities to make the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today. We don't want to see our community groups struggle, so we are doing everything we can to future-proof them and to help them thrive. Mr Chair, this program will do so much more than just help our community organisations to save money. Our Resilient Clubs program will lead the way to help our clubs be more sustainable and environmentally friendly by helping them to save water and reduce electricity usage. This is another example of the Schrinner administration continuing to deliver on our commitment to create a cleaner and greener Brisbane for future generations to enjoy. The Resilient Club Support Program will also support Brisbane's economy. We want these local upgrades to be delivered by local businesses, and it's great to see yet another program that will ensure more work for our local tradies, our local electricians and plumbers. Chair, this new 3.3 million Resilient Clubs Support Program is in addition to the $11 million in COVID support that has already been rolled out by Council, including $3 million offered through a community assistance program, which provided not-for-profit lessees funding of up to $10,000 to cover operating expenses and maintenance works during forced closures. We took early action to ensure that lease fees and other charges to Councils were waived. We then announced we would help struggling sports clubs by, by providing a one or $5,000 grant so that they could water their fields ahead of reopening. We have continued to urge the state government to reduce the state bulk water charge, which is the biggest single cost to clubs' water bills. Unfortunately, they have not listened to that call, but we will continue to make it. Our many years of responsible economic management has meant that we have been able to invest more than $29 million in local sport and recreation, cultural and community facilities in this year's budget. 
This $29, this $29 million investment is in addition to the Lord Mayor's $3 million COVID-19 direct assistance package. It's not only helping clubs pay bills that have piled up during their forced closure, it will also support leaseholders who have been unable to do maintenance work on their building due to a lack of revenue due to COVID. I want to thank our dedicated officers in Council's Connected Communities team and to thank them for working hard on programs to deliver even more support for our communities, like the Resilient Club support program that I have announced today. Mr Chair, only the Schrinner administration can be trusted to deliver for our community organisations. Our 3.3 million Resilient Club support program will support community organisations in every ward across Brisbane, delivering cost-saving tools that will have a long-lasting impact on the future of our clubs. We look can, forward uh, to each and every day as Councillor an Councillor Howard, your time has expired. Are there further questions? Yeah, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Um, and actually, it's probably of interest to all the administration councillors. I'd be interested in hearing everyone's opinions at some point in the future. But, Lord Mayor, your administration and, in fact, your party at both the council and at the state level has refused to call for or commit to an increase in funding for public housing and community housing. You've also expressed genuine concerns about rising homelessness in Brisbane, and you, you seem to genuinely care about the fact that more and more people in our city are becoming homeless. Your administration says that it doesn't want to enact any policy mechanisms that might put downward pressure on housing affordability, but at the same time has said that supporting the construction of more private dwellings would improve housing affordability. This seems to be a bit of an inconsistency in approach where simultaneously you say you don't want property values to drop, but you're also concerned about housing affordability, yet you also don't want to put money towards public housing. So I'm interested in what you see as the way forward for Brisbane as a city and our society and community as a whole to actually address homelessness and put downward pressure on house, house price values if that is the pathway to reduce homelessness. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Shree. There was a, a comment in that question about um, uh, my party refusing to do something. Well, um, look, I, I can't speak for state LNP, um, and I must admit uh, I'm not across every single policy announcement that they made, uh, and I'm sure that um, Councillor Cassidy wouldn't be across every single policy announcement that the Labor Party made either. Um, but what I can say is I can say my own view and the view of this administration, uh, and I have uh, repeatedly uh, in this chamber raised the issue of um, the public housing waiting list, which has 34,000 people uh, at the last uh, time I was told on that waiting list, yet according to the information that I've been provided, I'm aware that uh, there are only plans to build around 6,000 uh, public uh, housing homes uh, or social houses uh, on the state government's books across the, the state. So these are statewide figures. Uh, and so th this is obviously an issue. The, uh, the pace of investment uh, by other levels of government in that public housing is not meeting the demand. I think that's quite clear, and I've been quite clear about that. Uh, but uh, I did want to address one other uh, claim that Councillor Shree made, and that was, um, once again, he was asking what we are doing or whether we support putting downward pressure on uh, house prices. But we, I, I want to be clear, we do not support putting downward pressure on house prices. That is not something we support. We do not want the residents of Brisbane to have their most important asset to decline in value. We do not want that. Uh, so to be clear, that is not a policy that uh, my administration has or this council has, uh, we, because we know that for the average person in Brisbane, uh, and this is the case for many of us, their number one asset is, is their house. Uh, now, if that is their number one asset and source of wealth, and Councillor Shree is advocating for a reduction in the, the value of that asset, uh, what he is saying is that all of those homeowners across Brisbane, um, I guess according to Greens party policy, should experience a decrease in their wealth. 
This is not an attack on Councillor Shree, but indeed um, pointing out if that is Greens party policy, that is not something I support. So there's got to be a combination of responses to uh, the issue of homelessness, and it is easy to say that there's one single solution or one silver bullet. Homelessness is a complex issue. There are many different causes of homelessness, uh, and one of them, uh, for example, is uh, domestic violence and family breakdown and family separation. Uh, there's obviously financial stress. Uh, there's mental challenges and mental health issues that contribute to the problem as well. There are a range of different contributing factors and causes. Uh, there's no single one single uh, cause. Uh, and every person that experiences homelessness uh, is there for a slightly different reason. Um, and there is no one size fits all solution. Uh, having said that, when it comes to the response, there needs to be a range of different responses. And that is something uh, that we will continue to advocate for. So building public housing is not part of Council's remit, uh, but we are an investor in the Brisbane Housing Company. And it was great to hear the presentation that we had to see uh, that investment uh, and how it's uh, grown and been leveraged. Uh, and that is a, a really good thing because there are now uh, well over a thousand um, affordable houses that have been provided uh, here in Brisbane by Brisbane Housing Company. Uh, and that's a thousand extra homes that are assisting and indeed filling uh, some of that gap that's been left by uh, state investment or a lack of state investment. Uh, we will continue to support the organisations at the front line that are dealing with homelessness on that front line. Uh, and whether it's the council officers that patrol the streets every morning and every night talking to people that are experiencing homelessness uh, and working out how we can help them or how we can link them up with uh, the organisations that are there to provide the services. We will continue to do that, whether it's through the Pathways Out of Homelessness grant program that uh, I initiated uh, relatively recently and which we saw Brisbane Housing Company is benefiting from with partner organisations. We will continue to do those things. Uh, but I think that there is an opportunity here uh, to have a look at uh, what can be done by leveraging up... Hey, Lord Mayor, your time has oh. expired. Uh, further questions? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, with the, with the Camp Hill Zoning Survey now being finalised, can you outline some of the feedback Council has received from residents and their desired vision for character housing in the area? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hutton, for the question. I stand here very proud of the record of Team Shrinner here and our commitment to protecting the unique history and character of Brisbane. And we know just how important it is to engage with our residents and bring them on the journey as we plan for the future. We did it in 26, 2006 with the City Shape. Councillors, please, allow the answers to be heard in silence. The Deputy Mayor. And we did it again a decade later with Plan Your Brisbane, the largest ever community engagement exercise ever undertaken by a local government in Australia. No, no, Councillor, John, Councillor Johnston, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Uh, Councillor Adams. We asked some important questions about priorities and what people would like to see and what they wouldn't like to see. And we need to make sure that we were on the right track, particularly as we have 386,000 new Brisbane residents expected over the next 20 years. Two years now after Plan Your Brisbane was handed down, we have been chipping away at the action items, with many now complete. And we've been working hard to protect the Brisbane backyard and put a stop to the overdevelopment in our suburban neighbourhoods. We've delivered a series of award-winning design guides to ensure best practice design is embedded in building and construction, including the design-led city, buildings that breathe, and the traditional character housing design guide. And we are well underway in developing a housing strategy for Brisbane to ensure the supply of diverse housing options with a focus on affordability, as the Lord Mayor was just talking about, for people at every stage of life. But what we see here is a much smaller scale for the first ever community 
led zoning change. This pocket of character housing in Camp Hill has been in low medium density zone for nearly 50 years. But not much has changed in that time and most of the traditional tin and timber pre-1946 housing remains intact. The community came to council with clear views on what they wanted to see, or more to the point, what they did not want to see in their popular, as their popular suburb grew. There was a concern that the cookie cutter unit and townhouse development was diminishing the look and the feel taking away from the beautiful historic character of the area. When we first surveyed the residents about a plan to change the zoning, more than half the nearly 450 property owners were in favour of a proposal to change the zoning to character residential thereby restricting apartment buildings and townhouses from being built and ensuring one or two storey character homes remain the primary form of any new builds. It was an impressive grassroots campaign and now with the final round of consultation on the amendment package complete, Council once again has received a very high level of support for the from a majority of submissions received, making it very clear that the residents are supportive of our plan to preserve the character of this historic neighbourhood for future generations. It's a great win for the community. Can I say thank you to Councillor Cook for the effort that she's put in to make sure that there was responses from the community, because sometimes the hardest part is getting people to actually respond, and it's a great win for Greater Brisbane as well. As our city continues to grow and change, we'll do everything to ensure our exciting future looks familiar and our city remains a great place to live work and relax. I would like to thank everyone who took their time to have their say on the proposed changes to city plan. And once Council has finalised the submission review, the next step is to submit the amendment to the State Government for review. Pending that approval, the amendment can then be officially adopted into the city plan and the changes to the zoning will be final. It's a significant milestone in planning history and I look forward to bringing the amendment back to the chamber in the near future. Further questions, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it's come to our attention that there are serious safety and design concerns for your new double-decker city cats. In multiple reports, we've now heard that one of the new city cats has crashed twice into terminals in the last month, and that's because of concerns being uh, corners being cut when they were built. The article uh, also quotes that the accidents are indicative of what we revealed earlier this year. The 43-ton boat is too heavy and too wide for its assigned task, creating problems with berthing and wash. The report also says that a logbook from crew members says, and I quote, the vessel is struggling to keep up battery-wise and issues also flared with steering, port starter motor, bilge pumps, alternator belts and flooding. At one point, an operator reported that he was forced to, and I quote, use emergency steering sparingly. You've replied to these reports just now today that there's nothing to see here, and you've in fact said you're going to just uh, forge ahead and build more. Well, Lord Mayor, if there really is nothing to see here, why don't you make these logbooks and ferry incident reports public to prove to the people of Brisbane that you're not being shifty and secretive. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Cassidy is once again referring to unsourced gossip in a gossip column, not in an article, not in a news article, but in a gossip column, confidential sources say. <laughs> uh, like, it is absolute unsourced tripe that we are seeing here. It's, it didn't appear in the genuine news section of the paper. There wasn't someone standing up saying uh, such and such from this organisation has Lord reported Mayor. this or that. This is an unsourced rumour uh, and you can all speculate on the motives and the intent here, uh, but they do not appear to be good motives or good intent, which is why it's in the unsourced gossip section of the paper. Uh, but Councillors, what, Lord Mayor. But, um, uh, Councillor Cassidy, one of the things that I did uh, when I was a teenager was I, I learned to fly light ar aircraft. And uh, in the process of learning to fly, the first thing you learn is that landing is a controlled crash. Uh, and the idea is to do that as smoothly as possible, uh, and it is not always possible. And having said that, uh, docking a boat is exactly the same principle. 
uh, and the skill of the ferry master is very important. Uh, but I can tell you that in our entire ferry fleet, uh, there are multiple incidences where vessels uh, touch the dock a little bit harder than we would all have liked. That is just the nature of running a boat ferry service on the Brisbane River. And, and so to suggest that, oh, they touched the, touched the dock a little bit too hard. Oh, the boat must, let's scrap the boat. Uh, that is just ludicrous. That is just ludicrous. And the other thing that, if you knew anything about boating, uh, and I'm learning, I'm learning, I don't profess to be an expert, uh, but I've spent a little bit of time in shipyards and dockyards recently, and uh, the nature... Councillors, uh, councillors. Uh, councillors, uh, please. All right. Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Cook, please, please be silent. Councillor Johnston, please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question. Lord Mayor. And whether it's a place like the Yard in uh, Councillor Atwood's area, which uh, a number of councillors went to visit, uh, or whether it's the Rivergate Marina, uh, and other great facilities that uh, exist in our maritime industry in Brisbane, uh, one of the things that is quite apparent, uh, whether you own a city cat or a super yacht, ongoing maintenance work is required, and the battle of any boat owner is the battle against ongoing corrosion and the impacts of salt water, the impacts of uh, the river, the impacts of operating environments. Now, it's interesting because uh, many of these recreational vessels, uh, in order to get the same number of operational hours as a city cat, they'd have to be 100 years old. Our vessels are working hard and operating thousands of hours on the river. Uh, and they require maintenance, they require work. And our question is, making sure that the operator, who is contractually obliged to do that uh, maintenance work, is doing what they are supposed to do. Um, and so, it, honestly, when you read the article, anyone who knows anything about the industry um, knows that it is pure tripe, um, and it, it appears to be sour grapes with, uh, mal sour grapes, uh, with mal intent. Uh, but it is, as I said once again, the reason it is in the gossip column uh, of the Courier Mail and not in the news section. Uh, and uh, I would take that kind of gossip column with the grain of salt that it deserves. Uh, that's the end of question Point time. Of order, Point of order, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I uh, move suspension sending orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion that the Lord Mayor release all documentation relating to the manufacturing and operation of the double decker city cats, including all incident reports, crew, logbook, data entries contracts and engineering reports. Seconded. It's been moved been by Councillor uh, Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cook. Uh, this uh, item for urgency, I trust it's been distributed. Um, yes, it appears to be. Councillor, uh, Councillor Cassidy, three minutes. Please limit your comments to urgency. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Well, I think it's uh, particularly urgent because now twice this has been put to the Lord Mayor uh, to prove that these reports are inaccurate. Uh, he is saying continually uh, that it's just gossip. Uh, however, in those reports, uh, there are um, logbooks and incidents cited. Uh, so if the Lord Mayor thinks this is just gossip and uh, thinks these are just lies that are being told about the operations of these city cats, the double-decker city cats, uh, and that there are no issues and uh, there is nothing to see here, then he should uh, put up or shut up chair. Uh, it's urgent because if there is a crash, uh, another crash, we've, we've seen reports that there have been a number of crashes into terminals over the last few weeks. Uh, if there is a crash and residents get hurt that time, uh, and council did know there was something wrong, but the public didn't know about that, then who is liable, Lord Mayor, through you, Mr Chair? So I think these documents should be released, uh, these logbooks that detail uh, the serious safety concerns uh, and the serious safety concerns around the manufacture of these boats should be released. And if there's nothing wrong, then that can restore some uh, confidence uh, in uh, the travelling public of Brisbane, uh, in people that catch these but, city yeah, cats. Councillor Cassidy, can I please draw your comments back to urgency? Well, I think it's urgent, Chair, because uh, despite uh, continued reports of issues, not just in the last couple of months, uh, but going back uh, into last year and the year before, these issues continue to surface. 
They continue to bob along. Uh, and every time this Lord Mayor says there's nothing to see here, and every time he finishes saying there's nothing to see here, another concerning report emerges. And the most recent one quotes logbooks uh, and incident reports which talk about the failure of these boats to operate correctly. Uh, they talk about crashes into terminals, Chair. It is I, urgent... I, I appreciate that, but I must, I must insist. Urgency, please. Well, it's urgent that this information uh, is brought into the public domain so that there is confidence. Now, these are really concerning reports, Chair, about the safety and operation of City Cats. If there really is nothing to see here, then the Lord Mayor shouldn't just continue to stand up and say, it's just gossip, it's just gossip. I won't show you uh, the proof that it's not true. I'll just, just take my word for it, it's just gossip. Well, that's not good enough when it comes to the safety of the travelling public of Brisbane. Uh, we think these documents must be released uh, so there is confidence in our, um, in our double-decker city cats. We know that there can't, there's no confidence in the ferry fleet chair because they rotted um, on this Lord Mayor's watch. He ripped them uh, from the river and he's, he's sought um, no repairs whatsoever um, uh, they've been languishing there, uh, and he sought to privatise them and cancel cancel half the route. Point of order, Chair. Chair. Point, of order, point of order to you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, Chair, Councillor Cassidy's been going for minutes. We're yet to hear why he couldn't move a notified motion like no, anyone thank you. else I understand the point of order to you're get making. this issue debated. I understand, I understand the point of order you're making, uh, Councillor Cassidy. I must um, uh, I must draw you back That'll to urgency. Chair, You've thanks. got four seconds. Okay. I'll now put the uh, put the urgency resolution. All those in favour of urgency, please say aye. Those against, please say no. No. The ayes, uh, the noes Division. Have it. Division. Uh, Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Please ring the bells. Councillors, all those in favour of the matter, a matter of urgency, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Councillors, those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. And abstentions, please. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chairman, the have it. The voting being six in favour and 17 against and one abstention. The noes have it. Uh, councillors, we have concluded question time. Consideration of committee reports, please. The Lord Mayor for the Establishment and Coordination. The Establishment and Coordination Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 26th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 26th of October 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Mr Chair. I uh, just wanted to start off, as I usually do, by uh, referring to a number of the uh, great community causes that Council uh, supports with the lighting up of assets across the city. Uh, today, Story Bridge uh, and Victoria Bridges will be lit in orange uh, to support Colour Color the World Orange Day. Uh, the light up, this light up is organised by the CRPS Network Australia, who work on research and education of a little known disorder called Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, or CP CRPS. Uh, Colour the World Orange is an annual event to spread awareness of CRPS. Uh, November also marks uh, Lung Cancer Awareness Month and the mission of the Lung 
uh, Foundation of Australia is to improve lung health and reduce the impacts of lung disease for all Australians. In support of uh, this cause, Redcliffe Place sculptures, Victoria Bridge and Story Bridges, as well as the Tropical Dome at Mount Cutha, will be lit up in green uh, from Wednesday through to Friday. Uh, on uh, Saturday night, the Rugby Championships for 2020 continues at Suncorp Stadium with the Bledisloe Cup showdown, uh, with the Wallabies taking on the All Blacks. Um, and I don't think there's any conflicts of interest in this chamber when it comes to that particular match. No? Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're all supporting uh, the Wallabies. Um, <laughs> We're showing our support by lighting the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, Tropical Dome and Redcliffe Place in gold. Councillor Marks, not in black. <laughs> uh, this Sunday also marks the start of NAIDOC week for 2020. Uh, and NAIDOC week, as you're, know, as you're aware, is the National Aboriginal and Islander Day of Observance Committee. Um, and NAIDOC Week provides an opportunity to increase awareness in the wider community of the status and treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians and also to celebrate their history and their culture. The Victoria Bridge, Story Bridges, Redcliffe Place and Tropical Domes will be uh, lit black, red, yellow, uh, blue, white and green to support NAIDOC Week in the colours of the flags of obviously uh, the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag as well. Now I also understand that now that we're into November, it's uh, Movember, and uh, I, I wonder if there's anyone growing a moustache uh, to support Movember. No? Six years. <laughs> I, I have a little bit of a concern that we need to uh, refer to the ref, because I think the rules of Movember are you have to be clean shaven to start with. Uh, so I think someone's cheating here. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're going to need the ref to provide um, some guidance on that one because someone has a head start. Um, does anyone else want to take part in that? No? Yeah. No? <laughs> I did, um, did want to uh, touch on um, uh, the, the issue of the double-decker city cat that was referred to before. Uh, and once again, just... Just uh, repeat uh, my concerns that what Labor is portraying as fact um, is based on unsourced uh, reports in a gossip column. Now, uh, as I was, was explaining before, the nature of river operations for our ferry fleet, these vessels do thousands and thousands of hours, uh, equivalent to hundreds of years of normal recreational uh, vessel operation. Um, and I, I am not aware of a year in the history of city cat operations where a city cat hasn't uh, bumped into a terminal. It happens many times each year and it is sadly part of the ongoing operations of um, our ferry fleet. And as I said, this, this process of docking um, sometimes can be harder than others, uh, but we have clear processes in place whenever this occurs um, to make sure that all the appropriate checks are done both to the vessel and to the terminal. Uh, to make sure that both are safe to continue operating. But to suggest that a vessel bumping into a terminal is somehow a reason to scrap the vessel or that the vessel's not up to scratch uh, is just lacking a fundamental understanding uh, of river operations. And whether it is the first generation of city cats which were introduced by Jim Sawley, guess what? They crash into terminals from time to time too. Um, and we haven't used that as an excuse to scrap those vessels, uh, but the reality is this is something that happens and we have the clear processes in place. And so uh, when it comes to the operations, we expect uh, city cat and ferry operations to be done with the highest level of safety. Uh, we report any kind of incidents uh, appropriately to the Maritime Safety Authority and we do all the appropriate checks. Uh, but as I said also, uh, when it comes to any vessels in the Brisbane River, and particularly the vessels that do uh, the large number of hours that we do, they require ongoing maintenance, and they require ongoing work to battle uh, the forces of nature and the corrosion that occurs when you're operating in a uh, river environment like Br Brisbane, uh, and that mix of salt water uh, and fresh water that we have in the Brisbane River, and those challenging, sometimes operating conditions. Uh, this is just the nature of operating ferries uh, and we will continue to make sure that our ferry services are well funded 
and that our infrastructure is invested in at record levels because we are committed uh, to high quality rivers transport. We believe that our ferry network and our city cats are in fact one of the jewels in the crown of the city of Brisbane. They are something that are much loved by the people of Brisbane. And if there uh, is any lack of confidence uh, in city cats, I would suggest that it's only as a result of gossip columnists and Labor Party political point scoring, not because of any actual problems uh, or concerns uh, with the operation of those city cats or in fact the design and maintenance of those city cats. We will uh, continue to fund and expect uh, the highest levels of safety and the highest levels of maintenance. Turning to the items that are uh, in front of us, um, item A is the uh, Brisbane International Cruise Ship Terminal surrender uh, of trusteeship of the land. Uh, I had um, the opportunity just recently to uh, visit the new International Cruise Ship Terminal. Uh, I was out on the river with um, Councillor Atwood and the Ocean Crusaders. Uh, we had just been um, conducting, and, and also with Councillor Adam Allen as well, he was in a different boat, um, and uh, unfortunately his boat was smaller and he was entirely saturated. <laughs> um, and uh, we were doing some clean-up near the mouth of the Brisbane River, but on the way back in, uh, we stopped in at the new cruise ship terminal. Uh, and that asset uh, is just fantastic. It's pretty much ready to open. Obviously, they're awaiting the return of the cruise ship industry. Uh, but I am told uh, that uh, they are now taking bookings into next year uh, for cruises to uh, leave from Brisbane to various destinations. And there is incredibly strong interest in those cruises. Uh, the, uh, the nature of those cruises might be different. Um, the, uh, the buffets are out, unfortunately, um, but they've set up effectively like an Eat Street situation where um, you can go to different stalls and if you want to get Thai food, you can get Thai food, or if you want to get Italian, you can get Italian. Um, and so cruising will be back and Brisbane now has uh, incredibly high standard world-class infrastructure to accommodate the world's largest cruise ships here. Now, Council uh, has played its role in supporting this tourism infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that will bring significant jobs and investment in our, into our uh, city and support a lot of uh, workers and supply chains. When a cruise ship docks in the city of Brisbane, it's not a case of just a lot of tourists hopping off and visiting Brisbane shops and spending money in shops and restaurants and cafes. It is all of the fresh produce that is required to service the boat. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fresh produce goes onto the boat from local Brisbane suppliers. And that is just one example of um, the flow on effect out in the community. And there's a whole range of other examples like that where a big boat docking in Brisbane is just generating a whole range of economic activity uh, in our local community. So we've been very proud to support this project. Uh, and one of the things that we have done is obviously agreed to surrender the trusteeship of the land um, at the request of the state government. Uh, but we've also invested in significant road upgrades uh, to facilitate access in and out of uh, the new terminal. So this is a good project for Brisbane. Right now, it might not seem like it's, uh, it's uh, I guess, the right time for this investment, but the, as I said, the cruise ship industry will return and it will generate a lot of jobs and economic activity uh, for the city of Brisbane. So obviously we're happy to support that uh, surrender of trusteeship land. Uh, item B is uh, the Gresham Street Bridge significant contracting plan. Uh, Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Move for extension. Second. An extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you to the Chamber. Uh, I know, uh, Mr Deputy Chair, you're very excited about this project um, and it was great to be uh, with you on site uh, to, um, to have a look at what is proposed here uh, and to see what needs to be done. Uh, the existing bridge structure uh, is obviously uh, due for replacement to have uh, better flood immunity and also greater vehicle load capacity. Uh, and uh, Councillor Toomey, it's a timber bridge that a lot of people aren't aware. There's not too many 
large-scale timber bridges left in Brisbane, but this is one of them. Uh, and you can see they're very big and solid timber beams, but uh, their time has come. Um, and so uh, we'll be working to uh, carry out an upgrade and a, and a new bridge will be constructed uh, to provide access in and out of this uh, uh, section of the world, which um, has limited access at the moment through this uh, one bridge in and out. Uh, so it's an exciting project and one that once again demonstrates that uh, not only is council investing in major infrastructure, but it's that suburban in infrastructure that makes a difference in people's lives that we're continuing to invest in, uh, whether it's road upgrades, park upgrades, uh, bridge replacements, uh, we're doing that work that needs to be done uh, to support our community and to improve uh, the status uh, of our asset base and the health and maintenance of that asset base as well. Uh, so uh, I ask councillors to please support these two submissions. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on both of these items. Uh, first clause being the Brisbane International uh, Cruise Ship Terminal, uh, the surrender of land to the State Government for ongoing works. Uh, and of course, congratulations to the State Government for pushing on with uh, this project and so many and delivering uh, on them. Obviously another reason why people of Brisbane so rightly put their faith uh, in the Government on the weekend just gone. Uh, clause B is the Stores Board submission uh, for the Gresham Street Bridge replacement and associated civil works. Um, this one uh, is a little concerning. We're going to support this, but uh, looking at the contingency that is built into this project, it's got to be some sort of record, um, I think, Chair. This is a fairly minor bridge. Um, you can imagine if uh, when we see uh, the contracts uh, and the, the tenders come through for, say, the Green Bridges, for instance, if we see a contingency of this size on those projects, uh, that will be absolutely astronomical. So when you look at a project like this that should be fairly straightforward, you'd imagine, if you had a, uh, um, a well-resourced and um, you know, capable engineering uh, team within Council, um, if it hadn't been hollowed out under this administration, uh, you, would, you would probably see a contingency that was a lot smaller. So you, um, you can understand why the people of Brisbane chair um, will really start to lose trust with this Lord Mayor on these sort of budgets when you see uh, these sort of contingencies being built into them because uh, this proves that he doesn't even trust himself anymore to deliver a project on time and on budget. Now, uh, I can only imagine this is because the Lord Mayor was burnt badly uh, by the cost blowouts on the contingency for the Kingston Smith Drive project, and he's given himself an even bigger buffer on this one here to stuff up. Now, the bigger the contingency, obviously, the higher that residents' rates are going to be uh, increased because their track record on that side of the chamber chair is to use, uh, if not all of the contingency, almost all of the contingency on their projects. Uh, it's unfortunate that residents and ratepayers have to suffer because of this administration's incompetency when it comes to delivering infrastructure projects. Uh, at this rate, Chair, I imagine that if this administration tried to build a tree house, they'd probably need to build a million dollar contingency into that budget. Now, uh, going back to the earlier point, Chair, if there was an in-house engineering team to do the early works uh, that we're seeing uh, needing to be done and, and um, the reason we have such a large contingency, uh, we'd be able to properly plan these projects. Instead of getting a stores board submission uh, for a project that we have no idea of the issues um, that will uh, result in starting this project, if we maybe had a team in council that could do the early works before these things went out to tender, uh, we'd have a better idea um, of the final cost and we wouldn't have to have such an astronomical contingency fund uh, built into uh, the budget itself and presumably uh, going to be all used. Um, it would also, Chair, significantly reduce the risks that are outlined in this contract going forward. And the submission uh, that says there are significant risks uh, for unforeseen utility services or contaminated soil materials leading to delays and cost blowouts. So Council knows that there are going to be issues, just like there were those same issues on the Kingston Smith Drive project, which resulted in uh, tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of that contingency being used up. 
Council knows that there's going to be these issues, but have no capacity and no capability to do early works to identify them, to reduce the risks of delays and cost blowouts, and reduce the contingency within this project that is required. Alternatively, Chair, a cynical person might also see a very large contingency like this as a big ploy to claim that at the end of the project a little bit of money was saved. Just like on Kingston Smith Drive when this Lord Mayor uh, said and he showboated that apparently $15 million Point was saved order, on the Kingston Smith Drive you, project. Man. Council Cassidy is imputing motive. Um, I'll reflect on it and I, I think... I think that uh, in these circumstances, uh, I will rely on to proceed. However, I must indicate that, that no councillor can reflect adversely uh, on any councillor or council officer uh, in this place. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. And I said a cynical person may, a cynical person may, may think that putting such a large contingency in a project like this might result in maybe even if it's a couple of hundred thousand dollars at the end of the project that's returned, the Lord Mayor will be able to crow and say, we saved money on this project, uh, but he wouldn't come clean with the people of Brisbane and said, we had no capability to do early works early on to mitigate the risks of delays and cost blowouts uh, and to reduce the required contingency uh, because they have absolutely no idea how to deliver these projects on budget and on time, Chair. So I suppose in either, in either circumstance here, the Lord Mayor has applied his Kingsford Smith drive method to this bridge. Uh, the less contingency spent, the more fake savings this Lord Mayor can spruik uh, if and when it is uh, completed, Chair. But either way, either way, ratepayers are losing out. We have uh, an engineering uh, area within council that's been hollowed out for so long that we can no longer, as a council, properly plan projects uh, that results in projects costing more than they should uh, and therefore rates going up higher than they should. We will be supporting this project going forward, Chair, uh, but they need to be done differently in future uh, to mitigate against these risks. Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. I uh, arise to speak on item B, the significant contracting plan for the Gresham Street Bridge. I might start off by giving you some context of where the bridge is. Uh, as many of you in this chamber have uh, probably never been to Ashgrove or in the area. No, no, no interjections, please. Councillor Toomey. No, no, no interjections, please. Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Gresham Street Bridge is, as the Lord Mayor said, a timber bridge. It's been, uh, it crosses Inogra Creek from Waterworks Road through to an old suburb that still retains its name but has been absorbed by Ashgrove called St John's Wood. It's the only... Councillors, uh, Please appreciate that because Councillor Toomey is speaking from that position, uh, your interjections are much louder to him than they would ordinarily be. Please allow him to address the Council in silence. Thank you, Chair. It is the only bridge into the precinct. This bridge carries buses, uh, waste vehicles that are increasing in weight, yet this bridge is load limited. Uh, the bridge is come to the end of its life cycle, being a timber bridge, it's <coughs> held together with basically nuts, bolts and nails. Uh, it is an old bridge. It's some 70 odd years old. Uh, it's a great place if you want to go and have a look at some uh, local graffiti. It's got some wonderful poems under there, Councillor Shree, that, that uh, we've, we've captured with photo photography because they are they are fantastic pieces of work. Um, but like every piece of infrastructure in the city, it has to come to an end. Now, I want to address also that in this part of the creek, in Anogra Creek, there is a significant amount of rock and bedrock under the creek. Now, Councillor uh, Cassidy spoke about contingency. Well, Councillor Cassidy, through you, Chair, the reason why the contingency is there 
is for the preliminary works. There's drilling that's going to happen uh, from a nearby street, Philomena, going underneath uh, Waterworks Road, underneath the creek, to facilitate the gas main. Why would you move the gas main underneath the creek? To protect it from tree strikes and flooding. The same is happening with the water main. The water main is running from Monoplane Street, underneath Waterworks Road, under the creek, into Royal Parade. Again, that's happening to protect that particular asset. Now, when I was an estimator in, the, in construction, the first thing we learnt, the very, very first thing we learnt when we went to uni was, you will always lose your shirt when you're digging in the dirt. And that is why you have a contingency. Now, the contingency, surprisingly enough, doesn't have to be absorbed in the project. If you don't use the contingency, it goes back. It's only there as a precaution if you require additional funds when you are digging in the dirt. Now, I hope Councillor Cassidy takes that advice on board. <laughs> I'll go back to the bridge. The new bridge itself, uh, as the Lord Mayor said, is, it, it's pretty exciting for our suburb. Many residents in St John's Wood are looking forward to the construction of the bridge. And in fact, uh, their local Facebook page is spruiking all the benefits that the new bridge will give the suburb. It's going to be slightly higher than the current bridge, which means it won't go under when Inogra Creek floods. It's going to be a little wider than the old bridge which means that cyclists and pedestrians will be able to move across the bridge a lot easier. It's going to be concrete and steel, which has a minimum life cycle of 100 years. Now, most of our residents who do get cut off when you have an event, generally over 200 mils, can't get out of the suburb. So anything that happens while an event is on like that, they're stuck there. They have no other option to get around out because Inogra Creek circles the whole of St John's Wood. So this project is an absolutely fantastic project for the people of St John's Wood. It's a fantastic project for the people of St John's Wood who use public transport. It's a fantastic project for the people of St John's Wood who have their rubbish collected because it's going to continue to happen. And that is why I'm calling on the Chamber to support uh, this project going forward. But before I finish up, I do actually want to give a shout out to uh, our council officers. And I would like to thank them uh, on behalf of the residents of Ashgrove and St John's Wood for the fantastic work that they have done talking to our residents and setting them at ease that council will reduce the impact on their suburb as much as possible. We have been talking about this bridge being upgraded for almost 18 months now. And most of the residents are getting ready for it. They are excited about getting a new bridge. They are excited about watching the new bridge come up out of the ground. And they are excited to know that the services that Council provides in terms of public transport uh, and their, the waste collection is going to continue unimpeded while this project is on and ensures that those services will be continued moving forward because this piece of infrastructure is being upgraded. I also want to thank the council officers and the contractors who have done the pre-work. Councillor McLaughlin, they have accommodated the residents during this time of COVID above and beyond what I would consider would be required. The officers and the contractors that were working on the gas main accommodated all of the residents' requirements and facilitated them to be able to work at home without too much disruption while everything's being relocated. And I want to sp send a special thanks um, to those gents and those workers that actually did that. It was a fantastic outcome uh, and the residents fully appreciate Council's consideration while those works went on during the time of COVID. Finally, uh, I also want to uh, send an invitation to the Lord Mayor to join us when we open the bridge. I think it's going to be a fast, fantastic community event and uh, it's, 
It's going to be a wonderful thing. It's not every day you get to open a bridge, although we've done a couple already, but, <laughs> but it, it's a fantastic event. People love to see this infrastructure in place. They love to see council doing the work um, that they expect us to do, and they love seeing the infrastructure going out into the suburbs. Um, finally, finally, I'd also like to uh, thank um, Julian Simmons, MP, for the federal funding and the help that they are giving facilitating um, this project. This is a really big project. This is no small project. It's a $25 million budgeted project. It's a massive project that's going to improve St John's Wood and that area of Ashgrove immensely. So with that, I'd like to thank the Chamber for their, uh, for their uh, attention, time, and um, ask everyone to please support this project. It's a great project. It's going to have a great outcome for residents and visitors of St John's Woods and Ashgrove. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on both of these items. Item A, the uh, works at, uh, in relation to the International Cruise Ship Terminal and also the Stores Board submission for the contract for the Gresham Street Bridge, which we've just heard so much about, and thank you for that, Councillor Toomey. Look, in relation to item A, um, this, uh, the cruise ship terminal is in my ward, so I've been paying close attention to its construction and delivery, and I'm very pleased to see that there are forward bookings now for the return of the cruise ship industry, so I'm very pleased to see that that's coming, coming to fruition. Um, the road network out to the cruise ship terminal was, what, uh, was the work that was required, and we did that in partnership with the Port of Brisbane. So to Councillor Cassidy, who's no longer in the chamber, I point out that the Port of Brisbane is actually a privately held business, uh, not the state government. So we did the work in conjunction with the Port of Brisbane to upgrade the road infrastructure that goes and leads to the, uh, to the cruise ship terminal. Uh, and that was to do works on a, on a series of roads between um, the end of Kingston Smith Drive and out through Main Beach Road and out to where the cruise ship terminal is now located. And it is a fantastic piece of infrastructure, as the Lord Mayor said. Uh, it will revolutionise the way the cruise ship industry, uh, when it gets back to, when it gets back on its feet, uh, operates. It, it is a, a wonderful piece of inf infrastructure that will uh, bring in thousands, hundreds of thousands of tourists into our city and, as the Lord Mayor said, will ensure that we have thriving businesses in our area that uh, depend on providing services to the, the cruise ship industry. So uh, there, were, there were sections of road that uh, needed to be reassigned uh, as a consequence previously being uh, in council control not as road and now they're formally listed as road. That's what this item is about. There's also uh, a section that's uh, uh, the, the surrender of land for the, uh, the sec water waste water treatment plant, which is the other element in, in item A, uh, an area of land uh, close to the cruise ship terminal that is um, uh, situated uh, on land that was previously held in trust by council and is now uh, um, given over to sec water for their ownership and for future control. Uh, Mr Chair, item B, um, in relation to the Gresham Street Bridge significant contracting plan. Look, we heard a lot again from Councillor Cassidy about contingencies. Uh, as the Lord Mayor said, long may it be the case that the, those on the other side never get their hands on managing contracts because they clearly have no idea. Uh, this is, as Councillor Toomey said, a significant bridge construction project and it is most usual for uh, significant bridge construction projects to have at least a 30% contingency because of the unknowns involved in building, as you said, Councillor Toomey, in dirt or in hard rock. And that's why there is a contingency attached to the budget. Uh, Councillor Cassidy seems to believe that that's uh, free money. Uh, on one hand, he condemns Council for using contingency money when it's required. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, he thinks it should just be free money that's, uh, that's not attached to the budget and we should have budgeted without the allocation of a contingency. Well, that just proves that they have no idea about project management. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, new piece of infrastructure, <coughs> Councillor Toomey, as you said. Uh, it does replace a bridge that is almost 90 years old, made of timber. Uh, and I'm sure it was at its, in its day an example of great craftsmanship, but 
the city has moved on and it now needs to have a new bridge and that's what is being provided for there, which will be a, of great benefit to your community and to the rest of the, the residents of Brisbane. So I'm looking forward to seeing this significant piece of, uh, of infrastructure being delivered. As you said, and I also applaud the federal government for their involvement in this project through their bridges renewal program. It's great to see that contribution uh, towards uh, the delivery of this project, which as you say, has a total project cost of close to $25 million. Uh, and this will be another great feather in our cap for the delivery of infrastructure in our city. We are building a better Brisbane every day. Further speakers? Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Adams, that this Council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Welcome back, councillors. Are there any further? Uh, is there any further debate on the report? There being none, and uh, the Lord Mayor not being present, I will now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please. Councillor Adams. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 27th of October, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, uh, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 27th of October 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. The Economic Development Team and Council have been working very hard on a range of initiatives to drive demand and improve the economic vitality in the suburb and shopping precincts. And last week's committee presentation, we went through two key programs that are underway at this time uh, that include the Suburban Shopfront Activation Program and the Suburban Shopfront Improvement Grant, which opened for applications yesterday. So the Shopfront Activation Program has been up and running since February this year. Uh, obviously with a little bit of a hiatus over uh, the COVID uh, sec uh, time this year. But it's a pilot program that brings together owners of vacant shops with emerging business interests interested in trying their hand at operating a physical pop-up space. So each party registers their interest with council and our economic development team works to identify potential matches based on a series criteria like location, the type of shop they need, the local demand. We help to negotiate the occupancy agreements and offer a one-off $2,000 grant to each party to cover initial costs. Despite hitting a few roadblocks earlier this year, as I mentioned, the program has successfully <coughs> facilitated five business matches, with more currently in negotiations. And as I mentioned, the Shopfront Improvement Grant opened yesterday for applications. This program encourages property owners and tenants to refresh the facade of their shop fronts, to reinvigorate street appeal and attract visitors back to their local neighbourhood centres. Funding will cover up to 50% of visual improvements to a shop exterior to a maximum of $5,000. Um, if a dollar to dollar to match design to also boost Sorry. local <coughs> tradies and contractors. Excuse me, um, so uh, excuse me Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillors, if there are private conversations could you please uh, have them in the corridor? Deputy Mayor. Thank you. As I was saying, it is designed to also boost local tradies that may be able to do that work for the shop front improvement grant. So there is no DIY uh, renovations in this grant as well. The applications are open until 23rd of December. I said it's a pilot program. We're looking at a minimum of 10 grants expected to be awarded this financial year. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on item B and ask that it be taken seriatim uh, for taken voting item purposes. B will be, uh, sorry, just for voting. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yep. Just for yep. voting. Thank yep. you. Uh, look, uh, I just want to make some brief remarks about this. Um, uh, the petition itself here was something that happened um, uh, very early on, and obviously residents in my area, I encourage them to make submissions into the... Um, uh, the development assessment um, process. So uh, many residents made very detailed submissions into um, the development assessment process. 
Uh, and this petition is obviously quite small. It's, it, I wouldn't normally encourage people to petition uh, on DA matters. I know that's probably um, not the most useful way uh, to address these issues. Um, the issue, though, with uh, the um, houses being built at the Francis Lookout uh, or next to the Francis Lookout uh, Councillor Adams, I think, has been a little bit um, delusional about what's actually being built next door uh, on the block uh, where the DA has been um, where the DA has been lodged. Um, it presents as a low density house from street level in Francis Street, um, but without question, it presents as a three storey house. It has three distinct levels. It is a huge home on a small lot block. Um, it is without question going to have an impact on um, the values of the uh, Francis Lookout, which immediately adjoins. And we heard from uh, Ms Murray today um, that the information provided to Council and the State Government about the significant trees on the Francis Lookout was incorrect. Um, now, there is uh, a huge um, river red gum uh, and the tree roots will extend significantly into the adjoining block and it is uh, of great concern um, that the stability of this tree may be affected by uh, the development. Um, I don't think Council should have approved the DA in its current form. No one objects to a house on the block. Um, but the important thing here is that Council did have discretion to ensure it was smaller um, and that it was more in keeping with the uh, character of the area. And unfortunately, Council did not do that. Now, it's come to my attention that this developer uh, is a problematic developer in other parts of the city, um, which is extremely concerning. Um, and I'm very disappointed that Council, knowing there are problems with this developer in other parts of the city, has allowed um, such a large and non-compliant uh, dwelling uh, to be built. Um, it's just really disappointing when you see these character residential um, one areas and you see then what council allows to happen in them. Now, earlier today, Councillor Adams was talking about, um, you know, how Camp Hill residents are getting, um, are getting uh, the area rezoned from low density to CR character residential, I don't know if it's CR1 or CR2. And, and she stated, oh, how it would only be used for houses. Well, it's just not true. All over our city in character residential areas, we are seeing major commercial developments being proposed in character residential uh, CR1 land, and that is wrong. We are seeing huge three-storey homes being built in character residential one. We're seeing heritage-listed parkland impacted adversely um, by those um, buildings. So I'm really disappointed uh, that um, that there weren't more changes uh, made to the proposed dwelling. Um, it should have been uh, a smaller dwelling. Um, it, it has set an ugly precedent for the other three blocks, which is a bigger problem. Um, there are three more houses to come, and even in speaking with the assessment manager, it's clear that they, um, they will set a precedent there. Uh, so our community is left to fight off inappropriate development immediately adjoining a heritage listed um, environmental and cultural site of significance in our city that is mere steps from the Brisbane River Corridor and all of the wildlife um, you know, that exists. So it's really disappointing that Council has approved um, the DA. Uh, in my view, um, there should have been um, more reductions to the size of the house, increased setbacks from uh, the side uh, adjoining the park. Um, and because the DA was approved, in my view, we should be buying back those two blocks, including this one, um, so that there is a buffer uh, between the residential blocks uh, that are still to be developed and uh, the park. I'm disappointed that um, you know, the 100 objections um, that were made by residents through the formal DA process, many of which were detailed, thoughtful submissions, um, were not taken on board uh, by Council. And that included the um, Francis family descendants. So, you know, this is a terrible situation and 
the only thing that council seems to do um, is play a bit of politics with the state government. There's no question that they could have done better here, um, but they did not approve the DA. Brisbane City Council did. Um, and I am very concerned that the other three blocks um, on this site are now at risk. Uh, and uh, I don't support um, the recommendation here, which is to tell these poor residents that you've approved the DA, um, which they already know. Um, and it's just so disappointing that council has not acted to restrict the size, scale and scope of development on these sites to protect um, the significant environmental and cultural values of the Francis Lookout in Corinda. I don't support the recommendation and, and I'd certainly encourage all councillors to vote against it. Further speakers? Councillor Shri. Thanks, Chair. I just also wanted to weigh in on the St Francis Lookout um, or the ad development adjacent to St Francis Lookout. I, I share the concerns that Councillor Johnston and many local residents have articulated. Um, the recent uh, that was the first time today during the public speaker presentation that I'd heard about the concerns of inaccurate measurements of the, the trees and thus the, the tree and thus the tree exclusion zone. And I would urge through you, Chair, to Councillor Adams to look more closely at that. I think that is a legitimate issue that um, should be more closely investigated. Um, if the developer has provided incorrect information in support of their application, then that is sufficient grounds for Council to reject or overturn that application, uh, that approval. Um, and I, I don't think <clears throat> it's unreasonable of the residents to ask for a, that aspect of the project to be given a closer look. In general terms, I, I think St Francis Lookout is quite an important site for the city as a whole. It's not well known, but it is, does have a lot of historic value um, and its environmental value is also quite significant, acting as it is to be in a bit of a link towards the Riverside Green Corridor. So. I'm also a bit disappointed in Council's approach to this development. I think we could have done better, but I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> further speakers? Uh, there being no further speakers, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I just reiterate what has been said in the petition and said many times in this place. Uh, the application was for a house on a low density residential site, which had a house on it 10 years ago across these sites. It is beside a state heritage site which required the state government's approval. They looked at it. They also approved it with very specific conditions on the protection of those trees. I'll now put item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. And on item B, all those in favour of item B, please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston. And Councillor Shree, please ring the bells. All councillors are present. I will therefore uh, put item B again. All those in favour of item B, please say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Thank you, clerks. Please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 23 in favour and two against. The ayes have it. Councillors, we will now proceed to the Public and Active Transport uh, Committee, please. Councillor Murphy. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Just briefly, Chair, uh, last Point week's order, committee... Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I seek uh, the further following information uh, about this item. In uh, the Chairman's public comments, he left out a number of suburbs that are part of the River City Loop, uh, including uh, Fairfield, Tennyson, Graceville and uh, yep. Chelmer. Um, so my question is, are they part of the River Loop Wayfinding Signage Project? 
thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy. They are, Chair. Uh, so, Chair, this week's committee presentation was on the new Riverloop Way finding signage that Council uh, will be rolling out. So around 37,000 people walk or cycle along parts of the Riverloop each week. It's Brisbane's most popular recreational cycle route used by people riding for tourism, transport, recreation and training. There are two travel options, the full loop, which is the uh, training loop, which is 36 kilometres long, and the half loop, which is the tourist loop, 18 kilometres long, and crosses the Eleanor Chanel Bridge. So Council is installing uh, more than 400 new wayfinding signs and <coughs> pavement markings along the route to provide turn-by-turn -turn wayfinding that will direct users uh, to destinations and nearby amenities. During COVID-19, we've seen increases in active transport all across the city, particularly in riding for recreation. Uh, citywide cycling is up by 15%. So both new and experienced riders are looking for new routes and new destinations in our river city. Cycling routes are sought after by visitors to cities for sightseeing, recreation and exercise. And installing wayfinding signage along Brisbane's most popular recreational cycling route will open up the route for many new riders and visitors to our city, particularly uh, when the borders open once again and we can get tourists back to Brisbane. Businesses and other destinations along the route will benefit from the route being signed. The Riverloop highlights some of the best views of our city. Why not make a day of it and stop by some of Brisbane's local businesses on the way for coffee, juice or a bite to eat? Council has engaged specialist consultancy to develop the suite of uh, wayfinding signs. Brisbane's uh, uh, local uh, office of Dot Dash was involved in uh, developing the river loop here. And the new signs will identify the cycle route while providing the necessary information for all users to navigate the route efficiently. Each sign uh, will serve a different function. So we'll have major identification signs which will be placed at uh, entry and exit points along the river loop. This typically will include major destinations and entry or exit points uh, to the bikeways. We'll have gateway signs which will be positioned at key points along the route and will include a map showing the location of the sign and uh, major streets major connecting cycleway network routes, local area destinations and points of interest, public facilities, uh, other transport options, uh, gradients and distances and average time. So there's information on there, uh, not only for the, uh, the enthusiast cyclist, but also uh, for uh, tourists and people visiting our city that are looking for places to go. Uh, and of course directional signs that will be positioned at various locations with information about distances and directions to relevant destinations along the route such as shopping precincts, public transport, parks, health services. More than 400 signs as I said and pavement markings are to be installed over the coming months supporting residents and visitors to be active and healthy in time for the summer. Uh, and just uh, briefly, I just wanted to reflect on some of the commentary uh, that had happened in the chamber this morning uh, in respect of uh, the, the columnist, the anonymous uh, commentator regarding the condition of the city cats. Uh, I would, I would uh, not uh, add too much further to what the Lord Mayor's uh, comments were, but except to say uh, that we have some tremendous uh, local talent down at Oz Ships, uh, artists, uh, artisans, craftsmen, carpenters, boiler makers, welders, uh, uh, people who do the, the furniture and the seating, uh, elect electricians, uh, of course, even people that uh, design and refit the propellers, the shafts, uh, that do the uh, sandblasting. There are so many talented uh, tradespeople down there at Oz Ships. And I know that when they see uh, these uh, anonymous uh, articles that uh, nobody has had the guts to put their name to uh, in the Career Mail and they see uh, the denigration of the good work that they do building uh, what is an icon of the Brisbane River, uh, that they take it very personally and they find it deeply uh, insulting uh, and, and degrading to know that their work is being uh, questioned in this way by people who are, don't have the guts to put their name uh, to the comments that they are making. And I would say that they don't have the guts to put their name to those comments because they know they are indeed uh, not true and that the quality of these city cats and the quality of the work that is taking place uh, at Oz Ships, who won uh, a competitive tender process, a, a, a difficult and close uh, tendering process, and no one likes to lose out on a tendering process. I understand that. I understand uh, that the companies compete for work. Uh, but what has happened to them and what is occurring to them uh, is deeply, uh, deeply shameful. And I would just suggest that that 
is why we are not seeing uh, the people or persons who are making those comments uh, in the way that they are making them put their name to them. So uh, with those few comments, Chair, I'll leave the debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Johnson. Yes, thank you. I rise to speak on the item and I note that the Chairman did not have the courtesy to he did respond. Answer your, he did answer your question. He did answer your question. He said yes. I clearly recall it. Well then, that's very good to know because uh, when I heard about this item about a week ago, um, I made inquiries um, of the journalist and I note the press release that um, the chairperson put out covers the following suburbs. Brisbane City, Milton, Toowong, West End, Dutton Park and St Lucia. Um, the the uh, River City Loop runs through Tennyson Ward. Um, either Councillor Murphy um, is incompetent in that he does not understand where the 36 kilometre loop goes, um, or he deliberately um, chose to mislead the public by not including all of the information about where this project actually went. Um, if he has said yes today, that means the following suburbs are covered in this project. Um, and that includes Fairfield, Yuronga, Yurongpilly, Tennyson, Graceville and <coughs> Chelmer. Um, as the local councillor representing those suburbs, there has been no consultation with me about this project. None. There has been no consultation with residents in my ward about this project. This project is dangerous and it completely, completely misconceives the need for safe cycling infrastructure in this city. It's only a few weeks since a cyclist died on the River City Loop, died on the River City Loop, and Council will do nothing to improve safety at that location. Last year, a resident known to me um, had an accident on the Corso and is now uh, a paraplegic, a very serious accident. On a weekly basis, we have cycling accidents through the River City Loop, particularly through Yoronga, uh, and it is distressing for residents who at 5 and 6 a.m. in the morning have people banging on their door, asking them to call for an ambulance, asking them for towels and blankets, and this happens on a regular basis. What's Council doing to make this loop safer for cyclists? Nothing. What is this Council doing to make it safer for local residents? Nothing. What is this council doing um, to improve cycling infrastructure in my ward and other parts of the city? Absolutely nothing. There's a gold-plated solution on the north side of the city um, through the Bicentennial Bikeway and the other connections uh, through there, but there is zero, zero cycling infrastructure through my ward. Now, uh, I am extremely concerned that council is going to promote a river loop that in places is dangerous. We have a huge conflict between cars and bikes because there is no safe, separated, off-road bike infrastructure in my ward. Um, there's no safe, separated, on-road bike infrastructure in my ward. Um, I don't even know where these 400 signs are going to go. And you can be sure that I will be telling residents on the route, I've made a file request, that's how I'm going to find out, for anybody listening or watching to this, that's how I'm going to find out about what this project is about, because I've made a file request. The chairman has not bothered to contact me as the local councillor. The chairman has not bothered to consult with me or the community that I represent. And I think that is absolutely unacceptable. He knows that I am concerned about safety on the river loop because I have raised it in this place following the death of a cyclist. It's just unacceptable that council thinks the priority is putting up pretty signs, not actually improving cycling infrastructure in my ward and in other parts of the city. So I'll come back to what I said at the beginning. This project completely misconceives the need to provide for safer, um, 
dedicated cycling pathways for cyclists in our community. We have to be able to resolve um, uh, the conflicts between um, pedestrians, between cyclists and between vehicles. These streets are steep, they have sharp bends, um, they have lots of residential driveways um, and thousands of people every single day are riding through really quiet residential communities and it is not being managed well. This project is wrong in the sense that its priorities are not focused on improving safety, they are about publicity. Um, now, I just want to put on the record to the cycling community, I have no idea um, who council spoken to, hopefully Space for Cycling, I don't know whether they've spoken to the bug. I have no idea what consultation has happened on this project because the chairman has done it in secret and not consulted with me as the local councillor. I checked with councillor Sri, he's not been consulted. And yet two thirds of this project are in the Gabba Ward or in Tennyson Ward. And none of that, they're the two areas that don't have any cycling infrastructure. Well, councillor shri has got a little bit, but again, the only reason he's got some is because a cyclist had to die for this council to act. Now, I do not think it is acceptable um, that the chairman puts out public statements and leaves out Fairfield, Yoronga, Yorong, Pili, Tennyson, Graceville and Shelma. That is misleading in his public statements. Um, that left me to ask questions and make file requests because he didn't even have the basic courtesy to number one inform me, not even consult with me, but he didn't even have the courtesy to inform me or the public that he was going to undertake this project in the ward. That is juvenile political no, behaviour. No, <coughs> mate, the, Councillor Johnson, please, please limit name calling. It's pathetic political behaviour. It's incompetent political behaviour. Well, it does well, not on, reflect on. well Councillor on Johnson, this council. Hang on. No, Councillor Johnson, please. I asked you to limit name calling, I didn't and then call you just went and started again. The rules apply to all councillors, and you are a councillor. Therefore, the rules apply to you. I'm sorry, please I be respectful of that. I did not call him a name. I'm sorry, I did not call him a name. It just did not happen. So I, I'm sorry, but I did not call him a name, and no, your interference with I, what I I'm saying is not appropriate. I appreciate your apology. Thank you for apologising. I did not apologise because uh, I did not call him a name. Please continue your speech. I don't think it is appropriate um, that um, these sorts of projects are undertaken without consultation with the local community, without consultation with the local councillor, and not only that, when the chairperson makes public statements about the project, clearly, either incompetently or deliberately, leaves out a whole ward from the statement. Now, it's not a mistake. He didn't mention just Fairfield. He didn't mention just Chelmer. He left them all out. He left them all out. And it is unacceptable that the way in which I find out about these things is by asking a question in here, or two, having to do file requests. If another person is hurt or dies, it is not acceptable. This council needs to invest in the necessary infrastructure to support safe cycling, not in signage. Not in signage. I can tell you now that the five to 6,000 people a day who use the River City Loop know where it is. They've been going around and around it and around it for years. What's not happening is that the dangerous spots on this loop, they're not being fixed by this administration. The infrastructure to make them safer is not being invested in. And it is simply unacceptable that this council thinks this is a cycling priority. It's wrong. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, I might just say for the sake of the record that I, I wasn't consulted before the, um, com the, uh, this item came to the committee, but I, I did get the briefing in the committee and I was grateful for that. I'm generally pretty supportive of additional signage on the river loop. Uh, I do think it needs to be accompanied by safe cycling infrastructure. I note that one of the challenges with creating safe cycling infrastructure along the river loop is whether or not the public and, and local councillors are willing to support the removal of some street parking in order to create safe 
corridors for cyclists and, and separated bike lanes and subject to adequate public consultation, I am open to supporting that where there's a public interest in doing so. And I do think it's important that where we, where we identify the need for safe cycling infrastructure, we understand that there also has to be trade-offs and we have to be willing to lose a bit of street parking at times in order to make sure we can provide safe routes for those cyclists. Um, just picking up on another point that Councillor Johnston made, I do think it's important that for any of these cycling related projects that Council makes an effort to consult directly with space for cycling and relevant bicycle user groups from those areas as opposed to just consulting with Bicycle Queensland. Obviously Bicycle Queensland has posi positioned itself to be a um, an organisation to be consulted with, and that's, that's fine, but Bicycle Queensland has a statewide remit, um, and perhaps sometimes it's worth tapping into the local insights and local knowledge of some of those bicycle user groups more directly. And so I would just leave that as an open suggestion for the council that um, taking advice from Bicycle Queensland is good, but perhaps also take advice from Space for Cycling directly um, where there's a project that's gonna be of interest to Brisbane-based cyclists. Thanks. Further speakers? Any further speakers? There being none, Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just in response to uh, some of the points that Councillor Shree raised, uh, this uh, River Loop signage project has been uh, endorsed by both uh, 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 Cycling Queensland, so the, the people who race uh, bicycles and, and do it as a sport, and uh, Bicycle Queensland, uh, therefore the more recreational uh, cyclists. So, um, this, is, this is a really important project. It's been endorsed by both those groups, and I'll certainly take uh, the endorsement of those groups uh, that, that I will some of the other uh, more unhinged comments that we've heard here this afternoon from a certain councillor. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston. There is no seconder. We will continue. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee, please. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor McLaughlin? Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week, the Infrastructure Committee meeting um, heard a report on the process of condition auditing of council assets. The uh, asset management branch is responsible for determining the maintenance needs of council's asset base, which is valued at a staggering $27 billion, including almost $17 billion in infrastructure and land valued at uh, $4.6 billion. So uh, quite a portfolio within the BCC assets base. It includes eight cross river bridges, 22 <coughs> swimming pools, 87 wharves, jetties and boat ramps, nearly 10,000 hectares of natural areas, 5,800 km, 5, kilometres of roads and nearly 5,000 kilometres of footpaths and bikeways. So uh, uh, there's a, an assessment process that's underway, also, of course, for the repair and maintenance of assets like roads and footpaths. We rely on councillor reports and constituent reports, but the, the asset team is out there doing a default uh, review of all these assets every three to five years, looking for defects and streets that need maintenance work. Uh, and they're looking in particular in relation to the road surface for many types or various types of cracks that can lead to uh, road surface failures. Uh, Mr Chair, the council is also responsible for around 3,700 kilometres of stormwater pipes across the city. Each year, around 100 kilometres of pipe is inspected using CCTV and uh, visual inspection software. Um, that means inserting cameras into the pipes as one of the, the best ways to understand the condition of pipes to see if there are any defects that need fixing. Um, apart from those eight cross river bridges I mentioned earlier, the network has 184 road bridges, 383 pedestrian bridges, 344 park pedestrian bridges, and 2,278 culverts, a grand total of, of over 3, 3,197 bridges and culverts. These assets get inspected every 12 months and a more in-depth in -depth assessment every three years or sooner. Underwater inspections are undertaken for certain bridges. It is, uh, it's clear that asset 
management and the field services team that uh, undertakes a lot of the repair work have a huge undertaking each year to keep our assets in good condition, but it gets done and continues to be a priority each year. Um, Mr Chair, there were two petitions considered by the committee last week, a petition requesting Council implement traffic calming devices on Red Redwood Street, Stafford Heights, and a petition requesting Council install uh, traffic calming devices in Columba Street, Inala. I'll leave that to any debate in the Chamber. Further speakers, I see Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Listen, I'm um, rising to speak on, the, um, on item C, class C, I should say, the uh, traffic calming in Columbus Street at Inala. Um, I'm in support of the recommendation uh, that a survey of, uh, move, of uh, vehicle movements be undertaken. Um, and, uh, but I just wanted to put a couple of things on the record in regards to this, um, this uh, road, Columbus Street. First of all, um, it's been a road that's supported over the years um, a, uh, a TAFE, a high school, a uh, primary school, a childcare centre, um, and, uh, and that, that's back well before my time, by the way, uh, before I even come to work in the area. Uh, but currently it supports a upgraded uh, primary school, um, Richlands East, um, which was under uh, the uh, under a uh, program of uh, uh, of upgrades that happened uh, back probably about 15 years ago. Now um, the school has grown and continues to grow, um, and uh, also there is a new uh, annex school which looks after around about 200 kids. Um, the child care center is still there, uh, and there is a new one also that is. Uh, been, um, been, I believe, approved um, in Columbus Street uh, to be built um, probably over the next 12 or 18 months. Um, the road itself is uh, also a, um, a, a escape route off of Inala or Poncietta Street, actually, um, because, uh, because you can't do a U-turn in this very busy um, dual carriageway road, uh, Inala Avenue, which becomes Poncietta Street as well further down before it ends up uh, being um, Progress Road. Um, people turn, uh, turn um, uh, off, uh, once they've dropped the kids off at school, um, they then try to get back into the Inala suburb. Um, so being that they can't do a U-turn, the next street down, they uh, access that, uh, which uh, comes into Columbus Street. So it's a bit of a rat run, I suppose, but I, I, I'd rather not use the word rat run. I'd use, use the word escape route. So I just wanted to put those um, items on the record um, for our uh, chair uh, of infrastructure to take uh, into account um, when that survey is being undertaken. Now, uh, I would hope that the survey would be undertaken during school term uh, and not outside of a school term, but I'm sure the officers are aware of that. Um, also to factor in the new child care centre that's actually uh, going to be constructed as well, uh, which obviously wouldn't show up in the survey, but I'm sure the, the records are, are there and I'm sure they would do their due diligence. But um, I just want to mention that um, or put that on the record as well. So we're in favour of the recommendation for the traffic study. I wouldn't be at all surprised that it does come back uh, that um, some traffic calming remuneration should be undertaken because it is an increasingly busy road. Um, and there's also um, uh, Brisbane Housing has a quite a large complex uh, which was built uh, probably about 10 years ago, which is also impacting the, the numbers along that road as well. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Further speakers. Councillor Griffith. Uh, yes, thanks, Mr Chair, and I'll speak to item A and item B of this report. Uh, firstly, I'll speak to item A, which is the uh, petition requesting Council implement traffic uh, calming device on Redwood Street at Stafford Heights. Um, this basically came back, the recommendation came back saying that we shouldn't be doing anything uh, about traffic calming on this particular uh, corridor, road corridor, and um, the argument was that it's a bus route. Um, from our perspective, we believe that, um, sure, uh, speed platforms mightn't be what is necessary on this particular corridor, but it might benefit from pedestrian refuges along the corridor that actually may assist people in crossing the road and um, 
and enabling more people to catch public transport. So yes, while we understand not putting, uh, not doing something in relation to um, uh, raised platforms, it may be suitable to do other uh, other actions in relation to improving traffic flow along that road and pedestrian flow along that road. Uh, so we won't be supporting the recommendation here. Secondly, item A, which was the presentation. Um, it was very interesting, the presentation, um, and I must admit I was a bit miffed by the uh, asset condition audits because when I've asked about whether we do any condition audits of our footpaths, the response I've always received from officers is we don't. Uh, and that it's really um, the only way that we find out uh, whether footpaths are damaged or, or in poor condition is uh, by reports from the public. Certainly that's been my experience in my ward and my ward's a very large ward. Um, so, and there are constant issues with the state of footpaths and the poor state of footpaths. I'm gonna give Councillor Marks a plug and actually say, yes, Councillor Marks has been out and seen some of the footpaths. And I have to say that I have seen improvements a bit with what's going on. But in terms of what we received today um, in, uh, in our um, agenda, there's, there's a list of over a thousand footpaths here uh, waiting for action across most suburbs of the city. And it, it's, it's significant uh, actions that are required on footpaths from every suburb, Acacia Ridge, Albion, Banyo, Bald Hills, Barden, Bilbao, it just goes on. Um, so it's obvious that there are huge problems with the state of our footpaths and there's huge problems um, when we're trying to, to encourage more residents to walk, we're trying to encourage more residents to participate in suburbs, we are not doing core 101 work of council, which is actually maintaining our footpaths. And I think it was disappointing in the presentation we had, we got presentations where we saw road pavements and what they're doing with that, and what they're doing with bikeways, and what they're doing with drainage and bridge and culverts, which is great, and I'm glad they're doing that. What we didn't see is what they're doing with the footpaths. And um, the opposition will keep on about this issue because there's an issue that affects everyday regular folk and it's core 101 issue for council in terms of delivering safe, uh, effective, and useful footpaths for all our residents. Uh, so it was disappointing to see that that was missed in the um, asset condition audit presentation that we had last week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Uh, there being none, Councillor McLaughlin. I'll now put uh, the report. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 27th of, uh, 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Cunningham? Thanks, Mr Chair. Before I address the committee report, I wanted to update the Chamber on some exciting developments in the Environment, Parks and Sustainability portfolio. Firstly, I wanted to announce that Council's Habitat Brisbane program has its newest member group. I'm pleased to advise that the Douse Lagoon Bush Care Group has been successfully accepted into the program. Habitat Brisbane assists local volunteer bush care groups to restore native vegetation, contributing to Council's target of reaching 40% natural habitat by 2031. I acknowledge Councillor Landers and Councillor Cassidy, who's not here in the chamber, to hear, it, to hear about it, but I want to thank them for their advocacy on behalf of their volunteers. I also wanted to acknowledge another couple of awards that Council has taken out over the past week. As Councillor Murphy informed the chamber earlier, Brisbane City Council took out the Metropolitan Innovation Award for the Metro Charging Strategy at the 2020 National Climate Awards presented by the City's Power Partnership and hosted by Craig Rucastle. 
I want to acknowledge the officers from the news branch who have assisted the award-winning Brisbane Metro project. And it's yet another proof point for this administration's commitment to practical climate action. I'm also proud to inform councillors that the award-winning Oxley Creek Transformation Project has another feather in its cap, being honoured the Queensland Outdoor Recreation Federation at the Outdoor Queensland Awards. The recently completed Worrell Parkland in Larapinta in Councillor Owen's ward has taken out the Queensland Government Award for the Outdoor Places and Spaces. Congratulations to the Oxley Creek Transformation team on receiving yet another award for their outstanding work. On to the committee report now, and our presentation last week was on the Spring Hill Reservoirs and Mill. The reservoirs and the mill are located within Wickham Park in Spring Hill. Both are important cultural heritage sites for the City of Brisbane. The reservoirs were built in 1871 and 1882 and were used for water supply until 1962. The mill was built by convicts in the 1820s and it's the oldest surviving building in Queensland. More recently, the Western Reservoir has been adapted to support performances and events. We look forward to welcoming guests back to opera in the reservoir in November and to see this captivating space filled with art and entertainment again. Event organisers have worked hard to reopen the doors in line with the state government COVID plan. We also had two sets of petitions presented to the committee, both in favour and against backyard fire pits and braziers in Brisbane. As councillors would be aware, following a successful trial of fire pits in winter this year, the Lord Mayor announced that council will continue to allow the safe use of fire pits and braziers in Brisbane backyards and initiate a review of the health, safety and amenity local law. Council has always promoted safety messaging to ensure fire pits are used safely and with minimised smoke nuisance. We continue to urge residents to be respectful of their neighbours and to only burn clean wood gas, ethanol or charcoal to minimise smoke impacts. Council will of course continue to monitor any smoke complaints as received in accordance with the Environmental Protection Act. Importantly though, as we head into summer, fire pits and braziers must never be used when a fire ban has been announced by QFES. We also had a petition in committee last week requesting that Manly Road Park in Wakeley be renamed to Bill McFarlane Park and I'll leave the rest to the Chamber. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Cumming? Yes, sorry. That's all right. Uh, yes, I wish to speak in relation to item D, the uh, petition in relation to uh, Bill McFarlane uh, Park. Uh, Bill is a long time resident of my ward and uh, He's in fact the second oldest of a family of 10. He's uh, now 95 years young. Uh, and he's actually his youngest sibling, the late Grad Gravison, was an excellent singer who was the inaugural winner of the Seniors Idol competition run by the Brisbane City Council. But anyhow, Bill was uh, the president of the Marching Girls Association, Winner Manning Marching Girls Association. And he was also involved with the Basketball Association. And these clubs owned a large piece of land uh, in, in uh, uh, Wandle Road at uh, Manly West um, and uh, they had uh, managed to purchase the land when, at a time when land was somewhat cheaper and, but Bill and a couple of other gentlemen involved with uh, the clubs, uh, the late Gordon Howard and the late Cole Fraser, uh, purchased some 10 acres of land and then later on they purchased another two acres and they'd um, acquired all the land by about the 1966 and in 1968 uh, the late uh, Clem Jones, Lord Mayor of Brisbane, came down and opened the, uh, uh, the complex officially. So uh, it was where the Bunnings land now stands on Wanda Road, Manly West. And uh, this land was given uh, to uh, the Men winner Manly Meals on Wheels uh, and through Bill's efforts as uh, President of the Marching Girls Association. Meals on Wheels then decided to sell the land to the developer of the Bunnings site and also managed to get a donation from the developer, so they did quite well. And uh, the new complex has been built now and is uh, an excellent facility. And uh, I can say I volunteer once a month and, and the kitchen seems to be operating very well. Uh, Bill lives in AVO Retirement Village, Manly West. He was a successful businessman in Winter Manly for many years. Uh, well done, Bill, for your business acumen, your community involvement 
and your generous decision to donate the Bunnings land to Meals on Wheels, which he's been heavily involved with himself for many years. And I hope the sign on the site involves some background to Bill's involvement with the donation and the history of the Marching Girls and the Basketball Association. Thank you. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I just rise to speak on uh, the same item, the naming of the new uh, netball facility at 880 Manly Road, Wakeley, uh, to McFarlane Field after Bill McFarlane. I won't uh, recap on the uh, great history lesson that Councillor Cumming just gave for us about uh, Bill McFarlane's uh, contribution uh, to the history of the marching girls in the Wynnum Manly community. Uh, but what I will say is if he had not uh, donated that land uh, uh, to the Wynnum and Manly District's uh, Meals on Wheels Association, uh, we would not have the community facility that is at 880 Manly Road, which was built by uh, that association, and we would consequently not have uh, the terrific netball facilities that are there for uh, 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 boys and girls all across the eastern suburbs who uh, are using those facilities and, by the way, absolutely <coughs> loving them. So uh, the, the thanks of the entire uh, community across parties uh, uh, is, goes to Bill McFarlane for uh, the very uh, generous spirit in which he was able to donate that land from the Marching Girls, uh, held for a very long time uh, by the Wyndham Manly District's Meals on Wheels Association. Uh, they uh, were extremely patient in waiting to get uh, a parcel of council land to be able to build their facility on to serve uh, meals to the Bayside community. They waited a uh, better part of 25 years to see this happen. And I'm so proud uh, to, to have uh, seen this facility go from uh, a blank, uh, blank slate, an empty canvas, to net what is now, I would say, uh, one of the best uh, smaller scale netball facilities uh, in the entire city of Brisbane. And um, we have Bill to thank for that. And I can think of, uh, well, of course, we have Bill to thank for that uh, earlier on. And we also have Ken Edwards and his wife Irene to thank for that. So uh, those, uh, those two men and their incredible families uh, have made a great contribution to Meals on Wheels and to the sport of netball. And uh, I can think of no a uh, more fitting way to honour them than to name the park Bill McFarlane uh, or McFarlane Field after Bill and the centre, Ken, the Ken Edwards Centre after uh, Ken Edwards and we will be doing both of those things uh, as a result of uh, Council supporting this motion today. So I, I thank again Councillor Cumming for his comments. I also would like to acknowledge Nellie Hilda, uh, Bill's, uh, uh, Bill's daughter, who, uh, sorry, granddaughter, who's done such a good job at advocating for this behind the scenes and making sure that we know uh, all the history and have had all the documents uh, to be able to present to the Council officers. Uh, it, it is a great outcome and I know that um, he, will, he will very much be looking forward to us putting those signs uh, up. Uh, as I said, uh, as Councillor Cumming said, he is quite uh, advanced in age and was worried that if we took any longer, he might not actually get there to see it. But uh, he, he will be able to get there to see it uh, because we'll have this, uh, these signs up uh, certainly before the end of the year. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Just unofficially, it's very cold in here and it might just be because I'm wearing a T-shirt. But no, ma agree. maybe we could look uh, at the not, aircon. That's not Thanks. really in the report, though. No, that's fine. I'm just letting you know. So... <laughs> Um, but the report, and I'll give you credit, the report is about fire pits. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I, I got your message through eye contact earlier and I did turn the heat up. Um, but uh, I can still use my hands, so it's not that cold. Um, all right, I'll now put the report, and I would now sorry, call for you, Councillor Cunningham. Um, no, I said they're not cold. Um, all right. All right. No, there's, we're not taking. We're not taking. Having a debate about the temperature. All right. I will now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. And those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, count, uh, oh. Councillors, uh, the city. Count, all right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right, here we go. Councillor Mark, City Standards, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 27th of October 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Seconded. It's been moved by um, Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety 
committee meeting dated Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Before I get to the committee presentation, I just wish to announce to the Chamber that from the beginning of 2021, the State Government's school immunisation program will transition back to Queensland Health. Since the program's formalisation in 2007, delivery of the service on behalf of Queensland Health has left ratepayers footing a significant and growing funding shortfall. We have repeatedly raised our concerns directly with Queensland Health, but our request for additional funding only to cover our cost has been refused. Let me be very clear that Council is not trying to make a profit on a fee-for-service business model or anything of the sort. We very reasonably wanted funding to match the cost of delivery, something Queensland Health over many years after a repeated request by Council has refused to agree to. Since June 2019, Brisbane ratepayers have paid more than $1.7 million to subsidise delivery of both the school immunisation program and the community immunisation clinics. We want Brisbane residents to stay healthy and safe, but it's unreasonable for Brisbane residents to continue, ratepayers to continue subsidising the cost of more than 44,000 annual vaccines while the school immunisation service is largely managed by Queensland Health in other parts of the state. The community immunisation clinics will continue until to, into 2021 and free vaccinations will remain available for eligible residents through Council's weekly and fortnightly program. I can assure the ratepayers that talks will continue with the State Government to ensure remaining funding shortfalls for the community clinics program are covered. In light of Councillor Cassidy's urgency motion earlier this afternoon, which was a very timely one, and we 100 per cent agree with you, with Councillor Cassidy, through you, Mr Chair, about working collaboratively with the State Government, can we ask the Council, that the State Government take our request seriously um, in, in assisting us with this program, and Council will continue to deliver the school immunisation program for the remainder of the year and will work with Queensland Health to ensure a smooth transition from 2021. The committee presentation was about the task force um, against graffiti, otherwise colloquially known as TAG, and we also have another petition about curbside collection for Lakeside, Forest Lake residents. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, before I... Um, I want to speak to um, item B, uh, but... Um, there was um, a bit of confusion in regards to the papers that uh, came uh, to, the, uh, to the chamber today on the petition and the wording of that petition, specifically the title and the first, uh, uh, first text item, item 13. Um, I've raised this uh, with uh, the petitions people uh, in council, uh, uh, Victor, who said that I should I should move that the, uh, the words that are actually on the documents today uh, don't reflect actually what, were, what came to committee uh, a week ago. Um, now, I think it's a bit of an oversight. I'm not uh, casting aspersions on our good council officers, but um, the title uh, today, um, which uh, reads that uh, petitions uh, requesting council reinstate curbside collection uh, service for all residents in the Forest Lake Ward is incorrect. What it should, what it did say in the previous uh, papers that came to committee was petitions requesting council reinstate the 2019-20 curbside service to all residents in the Forest Lake Ward. Um, uh, additionally, uh, in the background, um, the uh, item 13 here says that two petitions uh, from residents requesting council reinstate the curbside collection service for the Forest Lake Ward's residents uh, were presented uh, to the meeting of council uh, held on, the, uh, on September uh, 2020 uh, by Councillor Charles Strunk and was received. Um, that that background should actually read the two petitions were received uh, by 597 signatures requesting council to reinstate the 2019-20 curbside collection program to Forest Lake Ward residents. So, um, if, if I may, uh, Chair, um, if we could have that be reflected, that that's the actual petition that my residents, uh, 597 residents actually submitted, and it was just to reinstate uh, the 2019-20 curbside collection in the Forest Lake Ward, and not the two years 
coming, specifically. So is that clear? I did talk to the chair uh, just prior to her uh, meeting uh, in committee today uh, to make her aware of this as well. So I'm just not sure if you've been made aware. Chair? No, but you have made me aware now, so. So can I talk to actually <laughs> what the petition is? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so, um, well, first, um, I would like uh, to propose that the clause B be taken seriatim uh, yep. for voting for purposes, voting. please. Item B, seriatim for voting. Yep, thank you, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the uh, two petitions before us today, almost 600 residents, all right, are asking, as I said before, <laughs> that the 2019-20 curbside collection be finished. Um, now, uh, Mr. Chair, there is 56 suburbs right across Brisbane who missed out last year on their collection, and, and I'm sure those, uh, those residents would like to see that undertaken. The 597 residents on my petition here, or the petition I presented, um, were, uh, were st that signed the petition, want, um, don't really want to hear from the Lord Mayor, hopefully this, this particular instance, that we can't afford this curbside collection because they've already paid for it. They paid for it in their rates last year and they didn't get it. And I'm sure the other, the other 56 um, suburbs that missed out on last year's curbside collection would like to have that undertaken as well. Now, I put a question on notice and um, I, it came back and uh, it identified uh, those wards and those suburbs um, that were missed out like Forest Lake residents who put this petition in. Uh, and they were Callumvale Ward, Jamboree Ward, the McGregor Ward, the Maruka Ward, the Paddington Ward, the Runcorn Ward, the Tennyson Ward, and the Walter Taylor Ward. So there was 10 wards that missed out. Um, some partially, not all their suburbs missed out, but, um, but I'm sure those councillors for those wards would like this council to do what they undertook in that budget to do, which was curbside collection. They paid their rates, and quite frankly, not to be able to, not to sit, receive the service that you pay for is not good. That's unacceptable. Um, and uh, and I, I was, it, it, and it also of course means that those 10 wards or those suburbs, those 53 suburbs, are gonna miss out on three years of curbside collection. Not two, three years of curbside collection. So, and maybe they are in agreement that they should miss out on two, if all of Brisbane misses out on two, I'm sure there are people in the ward that would accept that. There's a lot that don't, and we see all the petitions coming through. But not to receive the one that you actually paid your rates for, that everyone else got, the other 120 odd suburbs around Brisbane, that they got their, um, their curbside collection, and, and you didn't get yours, isn't right, and it should be addressed. And the Lord Mayor really should bite the bullet, find the money, finish the job, and this is what my residents want, and this is what this petition is about, and I'll conclude my comments there. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, yes, Councillor Strunk, through you, Mr. Chair, did mention to me the problem with the um, wording of the petition, and um, I apologise to him on behalf of myself and my committee and my officers um, for that mistake. Um, I will ensure that I make sure that I look through them and we try and but, um, make sure it doesn't happen again, but you know, we're all human, but I appreciate you bringing it up and it has now been rectified. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say about the we paid for it the service and we never got it. I know I paid 
thousands of dollars to a uh, private school for my children to go to, and they're now building classrooms that my kids will never ever use. Um, but you know, that's just the reality of life, I suppose. Um, the, we've mentioned this time many, many times before. The Good Neighbour Scheme is something that's still going. The Lord Mayor is continuing to pay for that collection service. If you have residents who need to partake in that, they only have to ring the contact centre and um, organise, um, arrange for something to be picked up that needs to be picked up if they are frail, disabled, over 60, the usual. Um, and as we've said in here many times before, it doesn't matter how many times you ask the same question, the answer is always going to be the same. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll now put, item, I'll now put the resolution for item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors on item B, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division, Division. Division. Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. Councillors, all those in favour of resolution item B, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 14 in favour and seven against. The ayes have it. Uh, Councillors, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 27th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, last week we had a presentation from the Manager of Customer Services, Lifestyle and Community Services on how the contact centre supports council. I think I can speak for every councillor in this chamber when I say that our award-winning contact centre does an absolutely incredible job in supporting our organisation and supporting our ward officers. I'd like to thank each and every one um, of our contact centre officers for their passionate dedication to Brisbane. And uh, their dedication, as I've said, is second to none. So it's great to see their wonderful work being recognised with the many awards that have been won over the year. It was an interesting presentation and um, it was also good to, uh, to see that um, Councillor Cook, I think, was a little bit late, but this morning she redeemed herself by having been to the Museum of Brisbane. And so on behalf of the Museum of Brisbane, I thank you for your, uh, for your uh, investment. And can I encourage all others in the chamber to, uh, to get along to the Museum of Brisbane and uh, also to, um, to, to do some shopping for Christmas. So on that note, uh, can, um, Mr Chair, through you, there was also one petition presented to the committee and is tabled in the papers, and I commend the report to the chamber. Further speakers? 
Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just briefly um, on the contact centre um, presentation. Uh, I just want to put on the record my thanks to all of our frontline staff who answer the phones um, and deal with our inquiries, like uh, most other councillors. Um, you know, I ring them on a pretty regular basis when I'm out and about, and they're always um, helpful um, and uh, efficient, and that's uh, really welcome. It is a great service that we offer. Um, a lot of these staff are actually based in my ward at Yurong Pili, and I know they work very hard and they're proud of the work that they do in supporting the residents of our city. Uh, so I just want to place on the record my thanks to them. I also want to offer the following constructive um, feedback. Uh, and I have raised this internally with the CEO and with Paul Salvati when he was the divisional manager and it's got nowhere. I think most people today would be shocked to know that when their local councillor uh, logs a job on their behalf, that it is sent to the call centre where a person has to retype the information because the ward office computer software does not uh, is not compatible with the council computer software. It is ridiculous. I've been here for 12 years and I, I was shocked. That there have been some problems, and this is how I found out about it about six years ago, with jobs coming back with the wrong information in it. And I'm like, that's not what we logged. Here's what we actually logged. And then the um, KPI that would come back would be have completely different information in it. Um, and that's how I found out that there is literally a person that has to retype it because um, a huge part of this council's customer facing infrastructure, our ward offices, where I believe it's around 25% of all jobs that residents want done in the city come through our ward offices, that's re entered by hand into council's computer systems. Now, every time we spend you know, half a billion dollars on IT and computer software upgrades, I, I mention this, um, it is not reasonable that we don't have software that talks to another part of council. Um, it would free up staff to be delivering more frontline services. It would reduce um, human error. It would be more efficient. Um, it, it's just a back-end software change. Council is making them all the time, all the time for offices in frontline services, except for ward office staff. And it is just ridiculous um, that we have a system that does not speak to council's computers. If, if you went to any other service delivery organisation anywhere in Australia and said 25% 25% of your customer interactions are being entered manually, they'd probably look at you and scratch their heads, particularly when this council invests so much money in software to support um, customer service solutions uh, for officers. So this is something that council must address. It will make things easier for uh, ward officers, easier for residents, and it will reduce um, overlap and um, inefficiency um, by having people re-entering data because our customer service solution doesn't speak to council's customer service solution. It really has to be fixed. I've been here 12 years. I, again, it's, I've written letters, I've had meetings. Um, it is just ridiculous that we do not have this efficiency. And I know in the time that I've been here, we've spent billions on computer um, systems and yet we still don't have a system where um, someone can come into my office, ask for a pothole to be fixed, and it can't go straight into um, an area where it can be allocated for action. It's got to be re-entered manually by somebody else before it can be. Um, that needs to be fixed, um, and it would be a huge improvement for everybody. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, yeah, I might just add to the um, points Councillor Johnston has made. I'm also very appreciative of the um, Council Contact Centre workers. I think in general they do a pretty pretty good job. Um, but I, I share the concerns about the lack of an integrated system. I think um, it's pretty obvious that that would be a lot more efficient and a lot more effective. And I don't understand why it's taken this council so long to introduce that. Um, 
none of the chairs of this portfolio and, in fact, the mayor, no one's ever been able to give me a really satisfactory reason as to why we can't have an integrated system where the ward office staff are able to access those case notes from the back end and why we can't all use the same. It, it, it should be simple enough that when a resident calls up our office and says, hey, I made this complaint to council, here's the file number or the reference number, that we should be able to look it up and, and see, what, see the details of that um, complaint or that issue. Um, it just makes things really, really inefficient. I also just wanted to point out that often I have experiences where I call the contact centre staff and they complain informally about how slow their computers are in terms of the mapping. They'll be looking up an address or looking up a location and they'll say, oh, sorry, Councillor Three, it's just taking a while for the, um, for the map to load. And that's not a big thing for me. It doesn't bother me too much, but I feel for those staff a little bit if they're having to navigate really with really slow computers and really outdated mapping service. So I just wanted to offer that insight to the relevant chair and to the council administration in general that maybe there's still some room for improvement on that front as well. But really my main concern is just that frustration of the lack of an integrated system. I don't think it's at all efficient at the moment. I think it's really silly that my staff have to, literally what they tend to do is just call it up on the phone because that's that's faster and more reliable. Um, we've kind of given up on ACT because it's so slow and clunky. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's a, a big bit of a gap. I'm, I'm not sure about, I hadn't heard that stat before from Councillor Johnson that it's 25%. Is, I'd be interested to hear from the chair whether that's true. Um, either way, it's, it's a significant enough proportion and, and my, my ward offices are very busy um, relaying complaints and issues to council and it's a shame that there's not a closer, more collaborative relationship there in terms of system integration. Further speakers? Further speakers? No, Councillor Howard. Well, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. And look, I, I thank the, um, the comments that have been made. Um, I will certainly take the, them on board. They, some of what's been said actually don't fall under my portfolio, but I'm very happy to be able to sort of um, take what you've said on board. I would just like to finish, though, by saying that um, our satisfaction of callers to the contact centre is well over 90 per cent, and I think that does say it all, and I think it reflects the comments that have been made of the appreciation that we do have for the officers. And, uh, uh, as we all know, technology sometimes is one of those frustrating things that we all sort of uh, need to get our head around. But um, um, on that note, uh, Mr Chair, I'd just um, commend the, the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Now I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 27th of October 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 27th of October 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. At um, last week's committee meeting, we had a presentation on uh, counting standards and uh, a number of the uh, various accounting standards were covered during that presentation. Some of these were implemented in the previous financial year, 2019-20, while others were implemented in the current 2020-2021 financial year. And uh, I'll only touch upon one because it's one that uh, often cause, causes confusion in the chamber here, and this is um, Australian Accounting Standard 1059, and it re relates to service concession arrangements, and in particular, it relates to the treatment of the Legacy Way Tunnel, Clem 7 and the go-between bridge. Now, importantly, these accounting standards, the change of these uh, accounting standards, the impact on the balance sheet was that we bought $3.86 million worth of assets onto the balance sheet and $1.7 million worth of liabilities. Once again, these are driven by accounting standard changes and often in this chamber we hear discussion about the liability side of this equation but we never hear any mention of the, the assets that have come onto the balance sheet. Uh, the P&L impact, there's a recognition of uh, other revenue of $54 million and a recognition of depreciation of $78 million. Uh, in addition to those accounting standard changes, the presentation also covered a uh, Brisbane Metro hedging uh, uh, position and uh, this hedge was taken out 
in order to secure the pilot vehicle for Metro and also the charging infrastructure. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Allen, I'll now put, uh, put the report. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a petition requesting Council rezone 21 Augusta Street, Aspley, in order for it to become a community garden. Councillors, you, hopefully you recall that uh, please leave your petitions in the place where you are standing and Mr Pearce will collect them rather than the, the normal, uh, the normal uh, way of doing things where he will come to you. Please leave it and he'll collect them after the meeting. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I have a petition calling for an additional shelter in the Curlew Park Dogosh off-leash area. Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you. I have two petitions requesting Council reinstate the Norman Park Ferry Services on 4 November 2020, when the Kitty Cats commence operation on the Brisbane River. Any other petitions? Uh, councillors, may I have a, uh, a resolution to accept them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Cook, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, before we move to general business, can I please remind you that if you have not done so, please sign the register. Uh, it is here on the media desk in front of me. Um, if you wish a copy of the uh, speaker, uh, the, the, the guest speaker from earlier today, her notes are next to it. Uh, councillors, are there any matters of general business? Are there any statements? Are there any statements required of, as a result of an office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? No. Other general business. Councillor Mackay. It's good to be here tonight, Chair. I rise to give an update on some news in my local community. First, I have to start with some troubling news. The Indrapilly Police have issued yet another crime alert. This time, in 14 days, 37 homes were broken into. And this includes a neighbour of mine in her 80s who had her entire home ransacked by what police are saying are drug addicts looking for a quick fix. And that includes, believe it or not, snapping off the brass pendulum from her grandfather clock because they thought it was gold. I mean, the stupidity of these people is, just boggles me. Now, look, I'm not claiming that this is Townsville-level crime or anything like that, but I do urge the state government to make sure... Lost. Lost. Excuse me, it's my turn. Thanks, Chair. Uh, as I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted. I urge the state government to fund the police and give them the adequate resources they need to overcome such crime alerts. I turn to the suburb sign program that we're running. It's a very successful program to improve our local amenity. We've now applied signage to walls and roundabouts, and we have signs for Chapel Hill, Indrapilly, and Turinga. And I invite everyone to come and check them out. Because if feedback is anything to go by, the local residents are very proud of their suburb signs because it gives them ownership of their suburb. Our sports field improvement program is underway at four of our local playing fields. Jack Cook Park in Turinga, Jack Spear Park in Indrapilly, Oakman Park in Turinga, and Moore Park in Indrapilly. And this includes fertiliser, herbicides, and work to generally improve the condition of the ovals. And this um, proactive work avoids costly repairs in the future. For the keen followers of the Fix a Footpath Blitz being funded from the Suburban Enhancement Fund, I'm thrilled that we have had people calling in reporting trip hazards and broken paths. And these are getting fixed very quickly, which is a testament to the council officers. And Brisbane's steepest street, Gower Street, has received a new footpath on the flat area. Unfortunately, the engineers say that this, the street is so steep that it can't have a path on the steep part because it doesn't meet the requirements. So what I've done is I've requested that a set of stairs be added to the list for consideration for capital funding. Hopefully we get that to improve the accessibility on such a steep street. 
Finally, I'd like to tell you about some developments at the Mighty Wests Juniors Australian Football Club. These guys have been at Oakman Park since 1928 and it's looking magnificent with the rain and the new picket fence that they've had installed. I'm working with the club to get some improvements including new bench seats for spectators, an upgrade for the bottle filling bubbler, new signage for them and as you may remember I spoke in this chamber about how some moron stole seven of the eight goalposts on the junior field. Why you do that I don't know. But as we do know, female participation in AFL is exploding and we're secured funding to refit the female toilet. Unbelievably, there was a loophole with the parking for pe persons with disabilities where they had a, a blue marking on the pavement but no signage. So people could park there illegally and get off on a loophole. But we've fixed that, so now the parking for persons with disabilities has been sorted out and next year, Finally, we're looking at some sandstone terracing for additional seating at this popular park. Further speakers? Wait. All right. <laughs> Councillor Maddock. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. Now, I rise to speak in general business. Uh, it's like the quick and the dead, really, in here, isn't it? So, Mr Chairman, I rise to speak on the LGAQ conference uh, that was held at the Gold Coast in October. Um, I just wanted to give an update to the Chamber. Um, I was uh, very honoured to be able to represent Brisbane City Council at the conference, and in attendance with me were Councillors Hammond and Councillors Cook. Um, and it was held at the Gold Coast this year, um, and it was um, certainly a, a, a very informative and interesting conference. Um, Full credit to the LGAQ for being able to hold the conference given COVID. Uh, there were a significant number of um, people in attendance across the state, but we also had a significant number of, if you like, uh, attendees who were ensuring that our the COVID safe plan that was implemented was being complied with. Um, and, and it was a great boost to the local economy of the Gold Coast because it was the first conference that they've held there since the lockdown in March. So. It was a wonderful event. There were a number of important issues that came out of it. We had the uh, reports at that time uh, from Minister Hinchliffe um, and uh, the chair of the uh, council tribunal gave her update uh, as to the statistics around the number of councillors uh, being referred, um, the process being undertaken at the moment um, the length of time uh, for people who have been referred and the processing of those applications. Um, and interestingly, even though a solicitor is not required uh, in attendance at these tribunal hearings, uh, every councillor who attended brought legal representation. So um, it's going to be an interesting time for all of us uh, moving forwards, particularly in this latest tranche of amendments to the Local Government Act. Uh, and that was also a point uh, of discussion uh, in some of the sessions and, uh, and generally uh, by those in attendance. Um, so we'll obviously have to work through those, but I think the most important thing moving forwards is that um, for all of these challenges that we face, um, local governments across the state and all representatives are passionately committed to the local communities. And each and every single one of them um, is doing this job because they love it and because they want to make a difference. And irrespective of the challenges that they face, um, they will continue to persist to do their jobs. In this last uh, council election, there were a significant number of new councillors elected, uh, men and women. It's great to see a great diversity of, of councillors. Um, who are just excited by the opportunity to serve, uh, eager to learn uh, and pick up new skills and play their part. So I, the conference was uh, uh, the first for many, uh, but it was certainly another well-run well one. And um, the debate and the motions that were put forward um, were really in depth in regards to um, not only the local issues, uh, or should I say regionally based issues, 
but important issues across the state um, from Brisbane's perspective around the, uh, the state government's um, South East Queensland Regional Plan uh, for the protection of koalas. Some of the motions that uh, we put forward from Council's perspective was in regards to the funding. Uh, we, of course, uh, as an administration, uh, strongly support the plan, the work that uh, Council has contributed towards that SEQ plan, uh, and now we need to see the rollout of the funding in order for councils to undertake that work. And we put forward a number of different motions that were strongly supported, uh, and there was obviously debate backwards and forwards, but overall uh, it was a magnificent event, and uh, I was very pleased to be able to represent our city at this important uh, conference. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak in response to the increasingly restrictive and xenophobic immigration policies that many wealthy nations have been adopting in recent years. And I hope the Chamber will indulge me if I share a bit of a personal story about my father's history as a migrant. When Upper first flew from Colombo to London in 1973, he carried almost two kilograms of tea with him in his small suitcase. Back then it was illegal, or at least very difficult, to take cash out of Sri Lanka. So my father was traveling alone across continents without any money. He figured that if something had gone wrong and his older brother wasn't at Heathrow Airport to meet him, he could at least sell the tea to an Englishman or use it to pay a taxi driver. It's fun to reinterpret this anecdote as a broader reflection of how Sri Lankans saw the English. Since the 1870s, the troublemaking British went to great lengths setting up tea plantations in Sri Lanka, enslaving workers to pick tea, forcing farmers to abandon other crops and start growing tea, destroying and clearing lush rainforests to plant more tea, torturing and raping and jailing and murdering anyone who resisted the expansion of the British tea industry. I can imagine a lot of Tamils growing up thinking, geez, these English must really love their tea. I've never asked up exactly how much he thought he'd be able to trade that two kilos of tea for when he arrived at Heathrow Airport. I like to think of him assuming that his little stockpile would instantly make him rich and powerful among the tea addicted English, with like British politicians and bankers lining up to shake his hand and attractive young people throwing themselves at him while he made it rain tea leaves. But obviously that's not what he was expecting. He was just a young man of color with no money and a year 10 education traveling to the West. To get to this point, he'd had to send a lot of application letters, handwritten. When I say a lot of letters, you might be thinking like 20 or 30 letters, but he tells me it was more like 400. In the library, he would find directories that listed British hospitals, scribble down the addresses in a notepad, then send off handwritten applications for student nursing programs, not even knowing which of those hospitals actually offered such courses. Obviously, he should have just Googled it. But he wrote week after week, month after month, until he finally got accepted into a nursing school in England. In the 1970s, discrimination against Tamils by the majority Sinhalese government was starting to fester. Upper was among the first of his generation to leave for London. But by the early 80s, with race riots blossoming and a civil war on the horizon, thousands of Tamils began emigrating to places like England and Canada. Upper once described the mass migration to the UK as karma for colonisation. And I feel like there's a lot of layered symbolism bound up in the story of a young Tamil man saying goodbye to his parents in his small village and flying off to the heart of the former British Empire, his suitcase stuffed with tea. In the following years, several more of his siblings made similar journeys. And when you ignore the finer details, their stories fit the cliche narrative of so many migrants from so many parts of the world. The first generation work until they have dark circles under their eyes walking instead of catching the bus, scrimping and saving to give the kids a better life. The second generation strive to honour their parents' sacrifices, skipping friends' parties and studying hard to get into med school or engineering. If Upper hadn't fallen in love with a white woman, I probably would have ended up doing medicine too. Among my immediate cousins on my dad's side, I think so far there are already six doctors and counting. Most of them also marry doctors. And they're proud of their family's story. We cherish these narratives of struggle and success, drawing warmth and light from them like small candles. How they started from scratch, arriving in strange new countries on one-way tickets, one suitcase, no savings. Some of my cousins drive Porsches and Bentleys now. They throw lavish weddings costing upwards of 50,000 pounds. They are not troublemakers. The threads of these stories weave neatly into the Western mythology of a meritocratic society. The countries like Australia and England are not racist. 
that if you follow the rules and work hard, you too can climb that greasy ladder and become rich and successful in the land of opportunity. But the English word immigrant still carries negative whispers. Like even though you have a visa and you've been allowed into the country, on some level you're still not entirely welcome or desirable. If you're a person of colour or maybe Eastern European, you have to continually earn and legitimise your place in society. If there was a certificate you could buy to prove definitively that you weren't a troublemaker, migrants would be lining up down the street for it. When I was younger, my sister and I would often spend a lot of energy trying to correct up his English. Although his grammar wasn't perfect and he had a bit of an accent, it's not like you couldn't understand him. So why did we do it? I think even as children, we recognised that Upper's accent marked him as an outsider and that life would somehow be better for all of us if he blended in and sounded more like a local. Correcting Dad's English was a futile attempt to correct his otherness. Anyway, the main point is that migrants like my father and his relatives have to be respectable, law-abiding citizens. That's how they want to see themselves and that's how they differentiate from other newer immigrants who are even less desirable. We were the good migrants. We came here legally, we played by the rules, but these ones who are coming here today are troublemakers. They'll do whatever they can to get into the country. We shouldn't let them in. The humble origins narrative leaves out that my father's family in Sri Lanka were still a fair way up the economic pyramid. They weren't mega rich, but they were comfortably middle class. My grandfather was a regional post office manager. There's no way Upper ever would have made it to England in the 1970s if his father was a fisherman or plantation worker. But even despite their comparative privilege, when you delve into the details, you learn that Upper and his siblings had to break the rules too, or at least bend them. It's only recently that I've started to learn this chapter of the family history when I stay over at my parents' place at Caloundra and Upper and I share late night cups of tea. It's not celebrated at graduations and weddings, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Upper doesn't like to own up to it, but there were a couple of jobs he worked in those only early years that he only got by telling his employer he was a British citizen, even though he wasn't. When one of his visas expired and he had to leave the country, he went to Canada as a tourist, enrolled in a university course there, re-entered on a student visa and worked illegally so as to avoid going back to the civil war in Sri Lanka. And he told half-truths in all those 400 handwritten application letters, implying he was passionate about becoming a nurse, when actually he hated the idea of emptying bedpans and mainly just saw the nursing course as a way to get out of Sri Lanka. And there were thousands more like him. Hell yes, they broke rules. Damn right they misled the immigration department. Of course they worked illegally on those student visas. But that doesn't mean that all those migrants were bad or dishonest people. The barriers faced by the parents and grandparents of so many of today's doctors, engineers and lawyers weren't placed there accidentally. And many of them had to lie and cheat to get through. But what sucks is that now they're ashamed of it. They don't pass those stories of loophole hunting onto their high achieving children and so those kids grow up, get rich and start to believe that they're superior to the migrants who are coming today. I tell Upper that he shouldn't hide this part of his story anymore, but I could actually be wrong about that. The countries that profited off colonisation and imperialism never wanted people like my father, and they still don't. Maybe they want the wealthiest skilled migrants, the ones that some other country has already spent a lot of money training to be doctors and engineers, but they don't want the doctor's elderly mother. They don't want the engineer's vision impaired brother. So migrants do still have to pretend that they're following all the rules, even though those rules are getting tighter and more ridiculous all the time. Upper didn't have to sell the tea leaves at the airport. When his older brother met him at Heathrow back in 73, one of the first things Paul started telling my father as they left the terminal was how important it was to follow the rules in England, even if those rules were unreasonable or impractical. Years later, when I was growing up, Upper made sure how I knew how important it was to follow rules too. Don't speak too loudly. Don't act strangely. Don't say anything bad about Australia. Don't be a troublemaker. But I know part of him is still secretly thrilled whenever I ignore his advice. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. Listen, um, I rise to speak tonight um, on some of the remarks that um, um, Councillor Mackay made in regards to the crime that he's uh, seeing in his, uh, in his ward. I think uh, there probably wouldn't be a councillor in, uh, in this chamber that doesn't, uh, hasn't experienced uh, an outbreak of, uh, of crime um, in their ward um, over the years. And certainly we had that problem in Forest Lake. And it's, um, and, and 
when it occurred, it's so easy to blame the police, or not so much the police, that uh, you blame the government uh, who funds the police. Um, if only we could have more police um, to, do, uh, to do the patrols uh, around our streets, uh, we'd certainly reduce the, uh, the crime considerably. Well, that's probably not quite true, actually. Um, I've uh, had a uh, working relationship with uh, the, um, the senior officer at the uh, Anala Police Station. We both started working, I started working in 2001 in the area of government. Uh, as an electorate officer, and he uh, he became in charge of that uh, station at the, in the same year. So, I've had a good working relationship with him over the years as an electorate officer, now as a councillor, and so he 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 tells the home truths, and um, and that is that you could have double the police, and you're still not going to get rid of um, the break-ins, the car thefts, and and uh, and those violent crimes as well. That is one way. That is one tool. Right is to have more police, but the other tool is for, uh, say, someone like the councillor or a state member, um, to actually work with the community to try to help identify where the problems are and how to address those. Now, Leanne Enoch um, uh, and myself um, uh, undertook a uh, crime watch form uh, early in my uh, tenure as councillor. Uh, and because we did have a breakout at that time. And uh, so we brought a number of council or a number of community uh, leaders together uh, in what we called the Crime Forum. And uh, this, uh, we met uh, for a number of months, uh, um, two or three months, and uh, we flushed and we worked and flushed out all those ideas that the community have to try to reduce the crime that was, uh, that was, being, uh, that was being foisted upon our community. Um, one of the, some of the ideas that came out worked well and we continue on with them. We had uh, one idea that came out with a, a website, uh, uh, so a virtual website called Crime Watch, which, which was like a, um, a neighborhood watch uh, in cyberspace. And, uh, and council got right behind that and uh, manufactured a number of signs um, to say that uh, Crime Watch, this, this site, this website, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is online, you can go there, you can find out information about what's happening in your area, and you can also uh, identify where you see crime um, if you want to do it that way, rather than, say, necessarily ring Crime Stoppers or the police station. So Crime Watch um, was established um, by Hamish, and, uh, and it continues today. And it's a great source of information for, uh, for local residents. Um, who may not want to be in a neighborhood watch because maybe they're time poor. Um, also, there is a program through, uh, through uh, the police department that you can register if you have cameras at your house, outside cameras that record outside your house or the area around your house because honestly, as, the, as Craig McKenzie says, all we need is one camera in each street and we can then tell when those cars come traveling past whether those cars belong to that street or not, right? So that's great intel as well. Um, also, we established um, a coffee with a cup, right? Um, uh, where um, where we brought the community together uh, at a uh, at a. In some cases, it was a shopping center. In some cases, it was uh, um, other 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 uh, venues. And we and and it was just an opportunity for the um, residents to actually have a in-depth chat with a police officer. Uh, in a comfortable situation, uh, and uh, it's surprising how much intel comes out of those those conversations, and we continue on with those as well. Um, there's also, of course, the police do have safety audits. They can come to your house and tell you where, um, how you should uh, secure your house and uh, and your property, um, because sadly, a lot of the uh, break-ins that happen, uh, the thefts of vehicles and break-ins that happen happen because we haven't been, uh, we, di we didn't do our due diligence when we should be locking up our houses. We've left windows open, doors open, things like that. Too often that happens. Um, we certainly don't want to <laughs> blame the, uh, the victims here, but uh, we, we do have a responsibility, I think, ourselves as well to do as much as we can do as homeowners uh, or, or tenants um, to look after the properties that we live. So um, 
I just want to uh, put those uh, few um, uh, suggestions on the record for other councillors here. Um, it's so easy to blame the, the, the level of government uh, that's supposed to be doing the policing for us, um, but we do have um, all the tools ourselves to try to help mitigate the crime in our areas, and I put it, uh, put it to Councillor Mackay, contact your local um, officer in charge of the Indooroopilly Police Station, sit down with him, get your community leaders together, you'll come up with some great ideas. They have, they, you know, honestly, the police will be the first to tell you a lot of the good ideas to come from the community themselves. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. I just want to speak very briefly on the Bledisloe Cup and I thank the Lord Mayor for uh, mentioning what a wonderful team the All Blacks are. Thank you. <laughs> Further speakers? There being none, I declare the meeting closed. Good night, everybody.